the June 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Committee of the Whole. And as we start today, I'd like to acknowledge that um, we are on the traditional lands of the Puget Salish peoples, past and present. We um, want to thank the caretakers of the land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the many urban um, Indians in King County who have brought their cultural ways of life here and greatly enriched our community. Today in our meeting, we'll, um, we'll have our usual, what's becoming our usual update um, from executive staff on the county's pandemic response. And following that briefing, we'll discuss an ordinance that would provide protections for tenants during this pandemic. It is possible that we will need to go into executive session to discuss this item. Following um, the ordinance on tenant protections, we'll discuss a motion calling for a retrospective analysis of the county's response to the pandemic and to a motion calling for updates to the county's emergency management. If there is time, we'll have another executive session at the end of the meeting as well. In light of the public health emergency, the governor has issued an emergency order suspending the section of the Oaks Meetings Act that requires that we have a physical space for the public to watch our meetings. This order has been extended by the of the um, state house and senate. And two further housekeeping notes um, as we get started. First, for those wishing to provide public comment at today's meeting, please be aware that we're taking public comment following the first briefing on our agenda. Please do stay on the line. And second, to help us manage the meeting, I'd like the public, as well as executives and council staff, to please keep your video off until um, just before you plan to speak or present. With that, I would ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci? Here. Council Member Dembowski? Here. Council Member Dunn? Here. Council Member Colwells? Here. Council Member Lambert? Here. Council Member Uptegrove? Here. Council Member Von Reichbauer? Here. Council Member Zahalai? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Mr. Chair, all members are present. Thank you. Um, before we proceed with the agenda, I'd like to uh, make a point of personal privilege. <laughs> Council meets weekly since the emergency declaration was made. A week ago last night, George Floyd was murdered by police officers in Minneapolis. Mr. Floyd, an African American man, was handcuffed and face down on the ground as an officer knelt on his neck for over eight minutes, pleading to breathe. Other officers were present as well. Watching the video makes me ill. The horrible truth is that um, this is one of many incidences of brutality and murder of African Americans in our country. And King County is not immune to this. Charlena Lyles, by chance Dunlap Giddens, an indigenous and other people of color have similar experiences. Renee Davis, Tommy Lay. The last week has witnessed impassioned and emotional protests of pr police brutality against African-Americans and other people of color and of racial oppression in America. Even when these protests make me uncomfortable, I must recognize that they are in response not only to an unjust murder last week, but to over 400 years of systemic racism and of African-Americans, ind indigenous peoples and people of color. The in injustices that occur today in systemic and personal ways need to make me feel just as uncomfortable. In fact, they need, they need to make me feel ill as well. That is the work ahead of us um, as, a as a council and as a country to address 400 years of legacy and recognize the um, bold event last week as people have protested. And to, to join them and support their work. Thank you. Cole Wells. Council member Cole Wells. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your point of personal privilege in making this statement. I, I'm certain that we all were um, feeling pretty ill when we saw the footage of uh, the murder of George Floyd last week, and more than ill, but anguished, outraged. I immediately thought of what I would be feeling like as the mother of one of my sons uh, or daughter uh, being in the place of George Floyd. And it seems unrealistic in many ways because I'm a white woman. But we don't think about these situations occurring and have occurred over 400 years. While I do not condone um, violence or looting or just any type of destruction, vandalism, I've been extremely troubled um, all week because I have been whenever we've had other incidents that have been similar. And I'd like to draw to the attention of individuals, and I'm sure most of you know about this, but coincidentally, May 31st and June 1st marked the 99th anniversary of what's been known as the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Originally, historically, it was known as the Tulsa Race um, Riots. But in fact, over 300 Black citizens were murdered over those two-day period uh, in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, with roughly 1,200 homes being burned, 35 blocks burned. And this was a prosperous community. It was also known as the Black Wall Street, uh, very prosperous, successful businesses owned by Black citizens. And yet I grew up not even knowing about that. It was something that was not in the history that I was taught. And more recently, it is being taught. But I think it's very appropriate, Mr. Chair, to recognize that as one of the, the more horrible uh, times in our nation's history, along with many others, obviously. But it's coincidental that it was on the same dates that we were having uh, issues of um, demonstrations and that got out of hand on the part of some people, I thought. Uh, but that's my, my add to your um, moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Balducci? Councilmember Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like you, uh, like Councilmember Colwells, and you know, so many people. Uh, this past weekend, uh, I just sat glued to my television screen watching uh, the events unfold in my district, in the city of Bellevue, and uh, in neighboring Seattle and across the nation. Uh, I was really proud of a lot of what I saw. I saw a large group of young people come out, mostly young people. <laughs> come out to, uh, to protest and demand change and justice after the death of Mr. Floyd in Minnesota, um, you know, which is just a yet another example. You named quite a few, and there are others we could name, uh, of how far we still have to go to combat racism and racial violence in our country. I was really glad to see our Bellevue Police Chief, Steve Milet, kneel with the protesters and express the support of every member of the Bellevue Police Force for their cause, because I believe that kind of acknowledgement, that kind of listening and joining in is gonna be key to how we chart a path forward and start to heal and start to fix the problems that have been endemic to our nation uh, since its founding, really. Um, I wanna say that we saw a lot of looting and criminal activity. And I was saddened uh, that that pulled focus from what I believe was the real message that I think that I want to encourage all of us and everybody watching us to continue to focus on, and that is the pursuit of racial justice. Um, the road ahead of us will be challenging. We haven't figured out how to fix this in all of the time uh, that we have been a nation, but we need to engage with it now. We need to make things better. Uh, and we legislators are in a position to, to make change. And I want to just state my commitment to this body and to the people we represent to work together with you all to do what we can to, uh, to start to make things better and to make our black, indigenous and people of color, neighbors and residents feel that they have the safety, the health, the opportunities that, that they deserve as uh, full members of our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Dombowski. Council Member Dombowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I am uh, trying to do more listening now than talking, uh, but I want to just uh, say two things here. Uh, one, I want to commend the racial equity team at Nathan Hale High School uh, in my district. Uh, they led a protest uh, for racial equity and against police brutality of some 2,000 people, all socially distanced, <laughs> I want to add, uh, down Lake City Way and through the northeast part of Seattle. And it was a, a beautiful uh, site and tribute and gave me in these really tough times when I'm having a hard time finding it some reason for hope and optimism. And that is that the next generation, the younger generation will make more progress in achieving what we and those ahead of us have been unable to accomplish. Um, and I really appreciate that. I also think it's worth noting at this time that uh, King County and our government and our functions play a key role in many of the policy areas that need to be addressed to bring actual impactful change uh, to some of the racist structures and functions of government that can lead to the tragic situation uh, that happened in Minneapolis. I voiced a concern and I've been working on it, frankly, since I've got here about the need with our own sheriff's office for independent investigatory oversight of use of force incidents. We do not have it today. Uh, we approved another contract this year without it. President Obama himself in his message highlighted the importance and the need for independent civilian oversight with investigatory powers of these kind of things. It's just fundamental to any profession, whether it be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, and I hope that we can pursue that work with seriousness of purpose and accomplish it. I do believe the public wants it. Um, and I just wanted to not let this opportunity go by to raise it as a continuing concern. Um, I appreciated uh, listening and learning and the opportunity to reflect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Dimbowski. Can Council Member Zahalai? Thank you, Mr. Chair, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much to my colleagues for these powerful statements. And I hope that we will translate powerful statements and translate these national sentiments that we're experiencing into concrete policy reforms. Um, oftentimes we continue to go through, the, through these cycles of outrage and protest because we as elected officials are not uh, effectively uh, change uh creating the changes that our communities are asking for so over the next couple of months while uh once our law and justice committee is uh, brought back uh, after the governor's restrictions on what kind of legislation we can hear are lifted i would love to call on my colleagues to join me in concrete policy solutions to these problems uh, de demilitarizing the police meaning that we take an accounting of what military equipment is coming in from the federal government and making sure those uh, equipment are not on the streets of a city during peace times, uh, restricting permissible use of force by police, increasing accountability and transparency in police union contracts, giving subpoena and other investigative powers to oversight boards and redirecting police department budgets to community-based alternatives. These are all things that community has been asking for for a long time and we play a role in whether these solutions are implemented or not so hopefully we all, we can all come together and pass solutions like this i understand that not everything is in within our was within our jurisdiction but we can all do our part to advance and support concrete policy solutions and i hope all of my colleagues will uh, join our efforts through the law and justice committee in doing that thank you so much Thank you, Council Member. Up the Grove. Council Member Up the Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I always hesitate to speak after so many eloquent colleagues have spoken so well. Um, I'm proud of my community in South King County, the opportunity I had to stand with community members and uh, uh, in several locations on several days 
um, speaking up against police brutality and racism and supporting our neighbors. Um, and as I listen to community members, particularly African-American community members, what I hear isn't just anger at the murder of George Floyd, but what I hear is a lot of pent up frustration, not only with the repeated incidents of racist killings by police agencies around the country, but a greater frustration with the institutional racism throughout the criminal justice system, but also a sense that the political system isn't working for them, that people who are in power are able to pull the levers of power and that there are a lot of forgotten Americans. And it's really caused me to do a lot of reflection about you know, the way in which we've failed, the way in which I've failed, the way in which the nine of us have failed. You know, I've been on this council six years, seven, uh, yeah, seven now in an office a long time. And why is it these problems keep coming up? And what is it I've been able to do or not been able to do to contribute to solutions? And I think we need to think bigger and we need to be bolder. We probably need to take more political risks. Um, and not always take the path of least resistance because these are difficult problems, but, and the solutions that have been identified by previous speakers are all ones that I strongly support. And I have a hunch most of these have majority support of this council. It's just figuring out how to get there. And I realize, you know, when you start talking to someone who's not part of the inside game, like we are, who aren't one of the elected officials, and we start when they say, how come you don't have independent oversight of the police? And we start talking about, well, you know, there's binding arbitration and, and you know, we the contract's only up for renewal this many years. And we get, it actually sounds silly trying to explain that to other people. At the end of the day, they look to us to have the leadership to move these big things. And so I think we probably need to think more strategically together as a group. Uh, whether it's around police accountability or whether it's around issues relating to economic inequality, uh, uh, tackling the issues of institutional racism, our criminal justice system, about how do we do those big things? We control, we really control two things, the, the county budget and county ordinances. That's our specific power. But we also have voices and platforms and the ability to shape um, responses at the state level and, and throughout the region. And so uh, you know, my heart aches for a lot of people who are feeling trauma right now because of everything that's happening. You know, I want my constituents to know that I do believe Black Lives Matter and that I stand with them and am proud to be part of a county council that's recommitting ourselves to um, hopefully making some progress in addressing some of these systemic issues and look forward to working with my colleagues to do that. Thank you, Council Member of the group. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our May 19th meeting of the Committee of the Whole. So moved. It's been moved. The minutes of the approval of the minutes has been moved. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the minutes are approved. That brings us to item four on today's agenda. Um, the first item is um, we, were, we are joined by Rachel Smith, the Deputy County Executive, and Dwight Dively, the Director of the Office of Performance Strategy and Budget, um, here to give us an update on the county's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Ms. Smith and Mr. Dively, the line is yours. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to kick us off and then I will turn it over to PSB Director Dively. Um, I did just want to say, and before I, I jump into my update, um, I wanted to thank all of you for your remarks that you just made. I want to thank you for your leadership um, and just simply add as it relates to our employees, um, you know, we know we must do more to address racial injustice and to protect and support um, our black colleagues and their families. 
Um, and as you all said, you know, this is the time for action and accountability, and we need to do that hard and uncomfortable work um, to truly disrupt business as usual, to um, show up the way that we want to, and to share power, and just wanted to acknowledge that on behalf of our employees as well. Uh, so, thank you. Um, so uh, I will ask also for your sort of indulgence and forgiveness as I move into my update today. There's a lot happening in real time um, as we are going to have this discussion. So um, I'm going to kind of walk through uh, information I have now um, when I have a dialogue and a, and a conversation um, and we'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, and then anything that we don't um, get resolved in this discussion, we'll also continue to work through very urgently for the rest of the day. So um, on Friday, as you all know, the governor announced the next steps for the state moving out of the stay home, stay healthy order. Um, and that included the ability for all counties to move to the next phase, phase two in the four phases that have been articulated by the State Department of Health and the governor's office, um, or a modified phase one, which they referred to as phase 1.5. Uh, I think you all know and uh, were participants in the discussion about uh, the executive also announcing that KC intends to uh, submit uh, for this modified phase one. Um, and so uh, I want to sort of quickly walk through three things here. Um, the first is kind of the status of the numbers and the public health thinking. Uh, the second is the process for submittal and approval. And then the third, I really kind of want to go through the key points from what is in the application, um, including clarifications and outstanding questions and really have that be a discussion. Um, so, uh, so before I do that, I also want to thank you all for um, sort of the engagement that we have had thus far. This has been really fast moving, and I know um, there have been a lot of conversations, but those who have shared thoughts and suggestions um, questions, guidance on general approach, that has been much appreciated, and I hope uh, you will see sort of uh, reflected in the discussion here. So starting with numbers, uh, when we last joined you, um, uh, Director Hayes walked through a number of the kind of numbers and dashboards, which included the key indicators dashboard, so the latest dashboard that we have added to the public health uh, repertoire of data that um, goes through all of the key indicators. And um, that is really what we have been laser-like focused on from a public health perspective. So the status of that, where we sit today, the COVID-19, so there's three sets of metrics, the COVID-19 activity metrics and the hospital readiness metrics. So those two are currently showing green on that dashboard. Um, that is showing that the county is safe to move out of phase one set of metrics around testing still show strong room for improvement. So based on this sort of combination of metrics, the local health officer is requesting this modified phase one. So that's sort of basing us in the numbers there. I want to just right out of the gate kind of acknowledge that our case count number, so that 25 per 100,000 that folks have been really looking at, that is, we are now currently at this moment meeting that standard that the state sent, uh, state set, which is up from the 10 per 100,000 that we had contemplated as the metric earlier. Um, but that being said, those numbers are very uneven. They are up, they are down. Um, you know, we look at them and while the trend is going in the right direction, we wonder, are they holding in place or are we starting to see a further upward trend or a downward trend? So that's really what public health is wrestling with and looking at um, when they look at those case, that case count numbers. Additionally, uh, what is not on that key indicators, but critical numbers that public health is watching closely um, our case contacts, which currently we do not feel uh, we are quite adequate in our ability to do case contacts, and the outbreaks in high-risk facilities. Um, in the last four weeks, King County has investigated, uh, I believe, 30 outbreaks in the county, and uh, the state is looking at a goal of three. I think we're, we're well above that. Um, when there's a lot of factors related to that, but that is just another key number that we're watching and looking closely at. Um, I will say that these uncertainties, as we watch this data, they're going to remain even as we move into phase two and into phase three. Um, I think that the key point to make here is that 
we have to proceed exceptionally cautiously in this moment as it is our first relaxing of social distancing after coming off the stay home, stay healthy order. So um, it will be important to uh, sort of worry about these, um, um, these fluctuations over the entirety of our reopening, but it is especially critical right now that we pay close attention as we first relax. Uh, second thing is around the process. So we got the paperwork for submitting the application on Sunday. Uh, our team has been working furiously to um, understand all the uh, requirements and get together sort of the basic information and data, much of which is what the application is based on. Um, we will hope to have that done very soon. Um, I'll flag that one element that is a bit time consuming that we've been working on is the getting a letter or an email from all 28 of our King County hospitals uh, stating that they will comply with the Department of Health's PPE conservation tiers um, and protocols should that become necessary. So we need to get that affirmative statement from them. Um, so we have been working on that. Um, once, so we'll have those materials together. The state has typically taken uh, 24 to 72 hours to review the variance applications. So um, we expect to have that same uh, uh, same timeline for ourselves. So if you kind of put all that together and gaze a little bit into the crystal ball, we would anticipate, anticipate or estimate that businesses uh, should be able to open starting this Friday. And that is, of course, provided that the businesses can meet the state's already published guidance. Um, so the things that they need to comply with um, that has already been part of the, the overall guidance. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that, um, you know, Secretary Wiesman, and also in terms of process, um, has stated that, you know, due to the limitations on the Board of Health that Chair McDermott can speak to, um, that the King County Executive and the Board of Health Chair would sign and submit the application, um, and that we, we cannot um, propose any additions or modifications or modified activities that the local health officer has not approved. I realize that was a number of negatives strung together there, but essentially um, what, uh, because the Board of Health isn't meeting right now, the, the uh, health officer would need to approve those things. Um, and then finally on process, I would just also flag as a reminder, assuming that our numbers hold and continue to trend in the direction, and then of course, along with the appropriate health and public interest and policy considerations, we would plan to move to phase two in no longer than two weeks. Um, so that's kind of the forward looking time horizon that we would be on. Uh, so finally, moving to the third piece here. Um, so uh, what I'm going to walk through right now is all of the activity areas and specifically the limits and requirements. I'm going to flag that these are or these are the activities that essentially Dr. Duchin is recommending that also fit into the state's framework that they put forward in the 1.5 phase. Um, as we go through this, um, I definitely want to hear feedback or thoughts, um, have questions. I'm going to flag a few things where we are still uh, seeking questions and clarifications. Um, so uh, do do want that to be a discussion as we go through it. Um, so uh, the first is outdoor recreation. So uh, this category, we would presume all activities here would operate subject to phase two guidance. So the existing phase two guidance. Number two, fitness. So all outdoor activities would be able to operate subject to phase two guidance, which limits the, um, uh, excuse me, just one moment. Sorry about that. Uh, which limits the uh, occupants to no more than five people outside of a household. This is excluding the instructor. Um, and then uh, here's one of those first points that I want to flag, um, which is indoor uh, fitness studios may operate subject to phase two guidance, but it would be limited to one-on-one -on -one activity. So again, we our interpretation, looking at what we have gotten from the state and in discussion with Dr. Duchin, is that indoor fitness studios would be able to operate subject to phase two, but only in one-on-one -on -one activity. So like kind of a personal trainer type of activity. The third category is gatherings. Um, this would be uh, only allowed outdoors with five or fewer people outside the household. 
Uh, next is additional construction. And then the following one is manufacturing operations. Both of those would just be, um, all those activities would be able to operate uh, subject to the phase two guidance. So essentially moved uh, to phase two. The next uh, category is real estate. I want to flag again, our interpretation here is residential and commercial. This would allow for all activities to operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that at no time uh, may a building's occupancy be, occupancy be higher than 25% and indoor services would be limited to 30 minutes. Next would be in-home and domestic services. Uh, uh, those would proceed as outlined in the phase two guidance. Next would be in-store retail. Uh, this would allow all non-essential retail activities to operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that at no time may a building's occupancy be higher than 15%. And again, indoor services limited to 30, uh, excuse, excuse me, 30 minutes. Next would be personal services. This would allow for all activities to operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that at no time may the number of clients served be more than 25% of the number capable of being served at any one time or one person if it is a single bed, chair, uh, sort of activity, studio kind of thing. Next would be professional services. Uh, here, all activities would be able to operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that at no time may a building's occupancy be higher than 25% and indoor services would be limited to 30 minutes. Photography, all uh, activities uh, subject to phase two guidance. Pet grooming, all activities uh, subject to phase two guidance with the exception that uh, at no time may a building's occupancy be higher than 25%. Um, and then on restaurants, sort of some uh, uh, breaking uh, sort of thoughts and changes here. So uh, this would allow for all outdoor dining activities to operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that outdoor seating is limited to only 50%. Um, additional or new outdoor seating would be allowed subject to public health guidance and city permitting. So this is one of those places uh, that we're having sort of an interpretation and a question and an assumption um, that, you know, obviously the uh, city and the jurisdiction in question would have the land use authority there. The other thing that we would propose here is that all indoor dining services may operate subject to phase two guidance with the exception that at no time may the number of clients served be more than 25% of the tables provided that the tables can be six feet away. So this is a, a sort of question modification that we um, are, are proposing as well here in restaurants. I realized that was a ton of information. So what I want to do is also to say that essentially, essentially, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm a lay person, so this is not sort of the, the public health frame here, but essentially we have looked at what was in phase two. We have looked at the governor's guidance, which is, which was basically a one dial back on each of those things. So in some cases, if the occupancy was allowed to be 50%, this would what's now being allowed is 25%, um, et cetera. So there's sort of like dials on time, dials on occupancy. Um, and, uh, and, and so what, what Dr. Duchin is recommending is, is sort of meeting in each of those with what is phase two slightly dialed back. Um, I do wanna also emphasize again, uh, Dr. Duchin has not finalized this. Uh, so, so things could change, but that's why we wanted to have the conversation with you as well get your thoughts and feedback at the same time that the public health folks are still doing that work. Um, so I wanna stop there, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I realized that was a lot of information and open it up to questions, discussion, um, or uh, further guidance or direction from the council members. Thank you, um, Rachel. If you covered it, I apologize, I missed it. Um, hair salon, hair um, barbers. Great question. Uh, so those fall into the category of personal services. 
So as a reminder, uh, that would be, those would be able to operate as described in phase two, with the exception that you can't have more than 25% of the number capable of being served at any one time. Okay, does that make sense? So, so I want, I'm, the reason the language here is a little bit different than 25% occupancy is because it is not tied just directly to the fire code's occupancy. It is also, it is tied to the number of clients that can be served at any one time. And again, all of this is really based in that social distancing, keeping the number of people in at any one time limited. Um, or if it is a single bed, chair, um, or studio, there would only be one person allowed at a time. Does that answer your question? Yes. Councilmember Dombowski. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and uh, Deputy Executive Smith. I just want to thank you for your tremendous leadership during these last few months. Uh, you've really, we're lucky to have you uh, there, and I really appreciate all that you're doing. And most of it, I know we're not even seeing, but uh, you've just done a tremendous job. And and uh, this is, I think, the latest example of that. I really appreciate your thorough and detailed explanation, and the and the and the nuance and specificity with which you're going through this process i appreciate you bringing it forward today to the council to uh, share it with us i i hope that um that all members will be able to take a look at the written application since it's kind of and i know it's very dynamic and you're working on it but it would be i think we'd like to see it and give any final suggestions as as you go forward um i appreciate it i had reached out with some some concerns or questions, which I think you answered mostly today. And I just wanted to confirm that, that uh, the, the commercial and residential in phase two with respect to real estate services are treated the same. And you're proposing that here in 1.5. Uh, yes, council member. And in fact, um, we I was very glad that you did flag this um, because we also realized that there was not clarity there. So um, we have, we have uh, affirmatively stated that in our application um, to be very Clear. And uh, if there is any um, if there is any uh, concern from the state, they would respond. But uh, your flag about the lack of clarity there is noted, and we have uh, in the application. Oh, and no, also really appreciate that. I think it's it's just going to be important for a lot of tenants who are struggling right now and need help with, from their commercial brokers, small tenants, to renegotiate leases and things like that to make sure that there's clarity that that those services are available. Absolutely. And then on the, um, on the small, the indoor fitness, it sounded like with respect to those, uh, I'll call them smaller studios, not the big gyms, but the smaller studios, if someone's doing a one-on-one, -on -one, almost like a yoga studio, but they're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, even physical therapy type stuff, that that can be done indoors under your proposed modification here if we get state approval. That is absolutely accurate. Again, uh, thank you for flagging that. And um, that is, again, one of those places where we are affirmatively stating that is our interpretation from the public health officer and from the policymakers. So, yes, assuming Great. we get approval there, you're absolutely right. Uh, appreciate your clarification and proposal on restaurants with respect to the new outdoor seating. That's great. Um, and then one other, this is a very provincial thing because I happen to have a big one in my district at Madison Park, but we do have a large indoor tennis facility uh, there. And uh, they, the operator has reached out, um, and I just uh, we're wondering whether or not either that that kind of use, and there are a number of these around the county, would be appropriate to include in in phase one point five, or because there could be a number of things like that, whether some flexibility and delegation to Dr. Dushin on a case by case basis, you know, could be built into this proposal to look at things because it's hard to capture every operation. Obviously, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, just a quick note on that. Um, yeah, we are still kind of working through that because you're right in these large facilities, but that are indoor, not outdoor. Um, what does that occupancy look like? And we are, um, you know, again, we are going to be using best judgment to interpret. That is, um, once we get the application approved, it is our understanding with the state that they support our ability to do that kind of interpretation. Um, and we undoubtedly are going to have some um, unanticipated um, uh, situations that we're going to need to address. And so we're also working through how exactly we're going to do that. Um, I, I think, as you all know, we have um, we've kind of stood up a number of different uh, 
ways to be providing support to the community, whether it's through gatherings or businesses, um, things like that. So we're really trying to get organized on that right now. So we know there will be incoming in terms of people asking, what about this? What about that? And so doing our best to uh, organize ourselves to be pushing guidance out, uh, being able to provide technical assistance to the extent that we can. Um, so so we're, we're gearing up for that as we speak. And I'll, I'd be happy to come back and talk a little bit more about it, I think, probably in about a week. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Lambert. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you and the PD executive. Um, lots going on. Glad I didn't have to take that down in shorthand. That was fast. Um, I have a couple of things. When when will you announce and how will you announce when it is time to move on? Because people are saying we don't know how we will get the information. So my first question is, how will you announce that? Uh, great question. Uh, so in the release that we sent out on Friday, we put that two-week bookmark out there, yes. in that release. And so um, we, we tried to sort of signal that's at least the time horizon that we're working on. But what I think we're going to try to do on those key indicators, that dashboard, I think we're going to be trying to put some interpretation out regularly, like through the public health blog and things like that, so that people can be able to see that and say, okay, we understand that because X, Y, and Z are happening, we are moving closer to that two-week target. Um, and uh, and I think beyond that, um, you know, we're going to be doing essentially kind of daily checks of looking at where the numbers are landing and how the uptick in activity is impacting them. Uh, but if we go in the same trend, and I guess I would also say we can anticipate the activity that needs to happen to get approval for phase two. So we can now be, you know, whereas, whereas in this last situation, we sort of have been presented with the opportunity uh, and the direction from the public health officer to move into this modified one, phase one. So now we're kind of quickly jumping to get the paperwork done. Here we, I think, can do the opposite. We know we're going to, assuming our numbers, will be able to move to phase two within this two-week window so we can anticipate getting our materials together so that we can move as quickly as possible and hopefully have a little more lead time for businesses to be out, which I think, council member, you're probably, is in the back of your mind there that, we want to be able to, to let them know so that they can do the preparations they need to fully move to phase two. I want to ask for three modifications. Modification number one, your hair can only be done for 30 minutes. After being in quarantine for these months, it's going to take a lot longer than 30 minutes to do my hair. So I think that <laughs> if you can go outside for five minutes and then come back in again, I don't know if they had that. When I read something earlier, the pets didn't have the 30 minute requirement, I don't think. And I laughed and I said, Well, my dog's going to be grown better than me. Um, so I think, you know, the, the target is you don't want to be in the same room more than 30 minutes. I get that. So go outside for five minutes and then come back in again so that um, you can get your hair done um, all the way it would be very helpful. Council member, can I stop and give you good news right now? Please. Uh, that 30 minutes has been removed. So you can get all of your services. <laughs> we can all get our mains done uh, for as long as it takes, which may be a little while. And as a, a sort of a little bit of background to how that public health discussion went, um, obviously what you just stated is right, wanting to limit uh, the uh, amount of interaction at the same time going back multiple times for multiple services doesn't really change or, or you know, and I'm not a public health professional here, but uh, doesn't, that just increases the number of, uh, of interactions. So that has been re removed. So good thinking and we're there. All right, so that, I hope that same answers on my next two. Um, I think that um, the 15% in the retail store is too small. Um, the box stores can have hundreds of people in them um, and they keep an inventory of how many people are in, but the little stores, especially those that have less than 10 employees, that is way too small. And for the most part, some of those are in areas that haven't had a huge COVID outbreak. So how are we going to get equity between the idea that in some places in the county, 
like the box store that I went to to get batteries the other day, um, you know, there were many, many of us in the store. We just had to log in six feet apart and they knew our number. Um, why can't that be done the same so you can have more people in the littler stores that are just barely hanging on? Well, thank you for that question as well, council member. And I uh, don't know that I'm going to have a completely satisfactory answer. I mean, there's, um, there's a, there's frankly a couple of challenging overlays here. So, um, you know, the essential businesses um, that were described in the stay home, uh, stay healthy order uh, obviously have remained open this entire time. And they've been open with modifications from the get go and with further modifications as, as we have progressed in terms of like, for example, King County's face covering directive. Um, and so, uh, but, but, you know, fundamentally those, um, you know, those essential services as defined by the state uh, have, have remained in that state defined um, uh, sort of operations status. I think what we are doing our best to do here is bring uh, at least for what, for this second uh, phase or phase 1.5, what is going to reopen is going to reopen with parity um, to the best of our ability um, in terms of the occupancy percentage. Um, but we are not in a place right now where we um, can change the uh, operating environment for the essential services to so the larger box stores, as you stated. And we are recommending, Dr. Duchin is recommending the maximum allowable percentage of opening based in the 1.5. Um, but I hear you loud and clear on that challenge. And it's a discussion that we're having often in how to bring um, bring enough safe economic activity to small business, um, be it restaurants or a small shop, um, to, to you know keep them going as we move into month four here. And then the last part is um, that my mayors are willing to take on deciding which businesses and how they open um, so that they can open as quickly as possible under the oversight of their mayors. So if you have a mayor that is willing to partner, and I know several that are, um, so that we can get this moving as fast as possible, that would be great. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. My hair pressure, well, thank you too. Thank you. Ms. Smith, I would ask, um, so if, um, and, and encourage and hope it would be a strong partner in unincorporated King County, about um, working with restaurants seeking to increase their outdoor seating. Outstanding. Um, let that—that that is a wonderful suggestion and thought. And let's take it up. Great. Other colleagues, Councilmember Dombowski. Mr. Chair, I was just applauding your suggestion. <laughs> wonderful. See you in White Center. Up the Grove. Councilmember Up the Grove. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Rachel. Um, my question, and, and I'm always hesitant to wade into this because I, at, at the end of the day, want to trust our public health experts to make these decisions. But at the same time, we as council members end up in sort of a spokesperson role. We're out there answering questions and uh, defending the decisions of the public health department. And uh, you may have addressed this, but to what degree can we deviate from the the state Department of Public Health orders and the, the 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 governors and are since most of this follows their guidance, do we have the flexibility to take different approaches? Um, and for example, I'm I'm struggling with the salons. I'm to Councilor Lambert's point. I'm very there's some advantages to being a dude with short hair. It's never taken me a half hour to get a haircut. Um, but we can tell council member. I know the uh, the fifteen percent feels very arbitrary at like a gut level, particularly if the stations in a salon are eight feet apart already. Let's say you have a small salon with four stations; they're each eight feet apart. They're socially distanced, and then but fifteen percent. Okay, you can only operate one chair as opposed to a more health-based social distance mask type of guidance. Um, and so do we have flexibility in areas like that, apart from the questions that a good or bad idea is, are we even able to do that? 
And then secondly, I want to pass along a concern directly from a constituent since I have you. It's a salon owner who actually is recommending that salons wait to 50% because at least in her salon, there is no financial model that works that would allow them to not lose money at 15%, yet she feels compelled to open or she will lose her clients to other locations. And yet it is costlier to her to do that than to remain closed because of the expenses it incurs. And so I want to pass that suggestion along. Maybe a way to phrase that question is, given how fast this is moving, have there been opportunities to consult with some of these industries, particularly in the, the, the salons? Have you heard that? Anyone else raise that, that issue about better to wait? And then do we have flexibility at all on things like 15% versus uh, social distancing? Yeah, great, great questions. And um, all completely aligned with all the discussions that have been happening both at the health um, at the health level and at the community level, as you just reflected. I think, um, you know, as it relates to uh, indoor activity, well, to try to answer your question specifically of do we have flexibility, um, I would say the answer is no in terms of we cannot, um, we would likely not get approved to do a, like, something between the, uh, modified 1.5 uh, requirements that have been listed by the governor and the Department of Health and phase two. Um, and so, so, you know, we are, we are in that space. I would say from the public health perspective, the reason, because all of these, I mean, to your point, it is, it is both science and it is um, judgment, sort of health judgment about, um, you know, moving, moving in some uh, measured way to increased amounts of activity. And so as phase two has been very clearly defined by the state and the governor's office, the activities that you see here are about halfway to that. <laughs> and so, you know, that really has been the, the frame and the thinking, I think, from both the sort of policy and the public health perspective. To your um, to your large, larger question of sort of like, does it make sense? I mean, we have heard some of the same things from business owners that like, it's frankly, it's just not going to pencil for them. And so I think that is why we are trying to, and the to council member Lambert's um, point, trying to signal, and we will do as much of this as quickly as we can when the full phase two is going to sort of trigger in the next two weeks, again, assuming the numbers continue to look good, um, so that we can, so that we can be moving everybody into that direction as quickly as possible. Um, I know that's not a, you know, real uh, satisfying answer. And I, I, I know that the, the realities of getting um, into the black for these businesses uh, feel, can feel disconnected from some of this some of the time. And that is a frustration that we deeply appreciate. Um, but I think, I think it is fair to say that right now we are, we are pushing to the limits of what I think the health officer feels comfortable with at this exact moment in time and what the state has said they will contemplate when we submit our application. We're sort of right up against that wall. That was helpful. Thank you. Cole Wells. Councilmember Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rachel, my question is a little different. If we are, are granted the waiver with the application submitted, and the numbers start rising, the, um, the number of positive cases and uh, the number of fatalities. What would it take then to go in, what would go into a decision about closing the whole county down or going back to the first phase versus perhaps through tracing, determining perhaps like nail salons seem to be where there's uh, too much contact and I'm just wondering what great, great there. absolutely so there's um you know as as a reminder um the local health officer maintains his authority to uh to put forward local health orders to make things more strict than the rest of the state has so you know obviously the governor has authority over the entire state in terms of, of shutting things down as he did with the stay home stay healthy order 
Um, if King County were to become in a you know dramatically different situation in terms of increase in cases, the local health officer could say either we need to go back to a blanketed um, uh, order of shutting things back down to the level that they have been, or he could, to your point, if we're seeing an outbreak in a particular industry, he could put forward a directive or an order to uh, sort of manage that situation um, and and allow the others to uh, maintain in whatever phase they are in. Um, I will also say that just as an aside, the state has also stated that they they would step in potentially to a county who might be seeing a major increase in numbers, uh, but is not doing what uh, the state Department of Health would think needs to be done from a public health perspective. So if you had some somebody have some county have numbers go through the roof, the uh, Department of Health secretary could come in and say, you need to dial back up, I guess, your social distancing measures. I would say in our case, the uh, Dr. Lofi at the state and Dr. Duchin are in lockstep on all things. That would never be a situation that I think uh, would, would transpire here in King County um, uh, under any circumstances, so. Could it also, to follow up, could it also be uh, determined that one part of the county is having the hotspots and not the others? So. For example, if Seattle were to uh, have that happen, and but keep up, keep consistent with the current uh, phasing for the rest of the county. Yeah, it's a great, it's a really great question because uh, I mean, so I guess to answer it specifically, yes, the the health officer would have the uh, he has the authority to do that. So the short answer, is yes, I would say one of the one of the things, and and this emerges anytime you're having a like like a major uh, situation like this pandemic is, you know, we are so reminded of how people move and travel, how this is a singular economy, particularly in this region. And people, you know, live in Tacoma and work in Bellevue, and then they come to Seattle for activities. And so um, we are we are wrestling, and Councilman Merlin, you said this as well, sort of wrestling with this jur this artificial jurisdictional reality that we have um, and, and in this case, it has really just been centered around the fact that this is our local health jurisdiction, you know, is for us countywide. And so, um, but, but the, the differences in how the disease has manifested across the county is real. Um, and so to the extent that we begin to move forward, we see to use the scalpel instead of the hammer to manage the disease. You can bet that Dr. Duchin will want to do that. Um, but I think we'll we will have to sort of take into consideration all of the you know again all the metrics that we're looking at exactly what is transpiring. I mean I'll also just add that one thing that Dr. Duchin is has also talked about. I think Patty might have mentioned this in the last briefing that she had with all of you is you know to date the places that we have had the most um, uh, concern is in you know homeless situations, uh, long term care facility situations detention situations, although luckily we've not had a lot of um, activity, disease activity there. Um, but, you know, Dr. Duchin, if he was here, would say employment situations is going to be the, the next place where we have to manage through outbreaks. So one of the other things that we're also um, going to be working with some of the large employers who have a lot of campus and a lot of real estate, um, how can they help? How can they how can they help public health um, be able to identify and be able to do some of that case contact tracing? Mm -hmm. Uh, that you mentioned um, to, you know, it is it is certainly within their financial interest to be uh, keeping uh, the disease managed in their own facilities. So we're we're going to have those discussions with them. And just very lastly, uh, you mentioned about the whole county that people move around a lot, and to me, an issue is with our metro transit buses too, when people are not wearing masks or face coverings. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I missed last thing you said. Councilmember Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have uh, two questions and a request. I will go very quickly. The first question is about uh, going back to the metrics that you talked about, and uh, you mentioned Rachel that we want to see improvement in some areas, including um, that we're testing enough, that we're testing quickly enough that we have enough contact tracing. Uh, can you share a little bit more about how we're progressing? Because this is looking forward to phase two. And I actually think that um, phase 1.5 has caused a lot of work 
uh, it's good. It's good that we have the ability to start to test uh, in, in the sense of seeing things open and seeing how it goes in a, in a, in a limited way, safely allows some economic activity. But it's also caused a lot of questions and confusion. And as you alluded to, sort of took our, our focus away from moving towards phase two, which is, I think, where we ultimately want to be when we're ready for it. So can you talk a little bit about what it will take for us to get ready to have that full application for phase two and do it safely? Absolutely. Um, so uh, in the couple of things, um, and thank you again for the question, the, the testing space is one where um, we are doing a lot of work right now. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Duchin has, uh, wor working with all the other EPIs and docs, has been able to articulate kind of the number of tests that we would need based on the number of cases that we are seeing. Um, and that is, that is an important sort of public health requirement and need and kind of what this testing is looking at. But the executive has also directed us to really go above and beyond that, to really figure out how we can have a more robust testing regimen across the county um, so that when we have uh, uh, Councilmember Wells's point, you know, a small outbreak when we have a situation that we want to like quickly be able to get in and understand and move and get people isolated and quarantined, um, we can we we have the testing capacity to do that. I will uh, acknowledge and thank uh, the city of Seattle who has procured some of their own tests and is going to set up some uh, some more testing sites um, for people to proactively go get tested, uh, but. I think you know what we ultimately want to be able to do is not not just to have an individual think to themselves that they proactively want to go get tested, but in fact to be able to say, oh, uh, an outbreak emerged in this uh, you know business or uh, area or activity, we are going to proactively go in and say, hey, can we test you? So we're working on. Um, you know, getting the materials, the test kits for that, we have the lab capacity and then figuring out how we would deploy that. And I, I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the ways that we're sort of thinking about it is when you look at that metrics sheet, there's the COVID cases, there's the testing, and then there's the hospital readiness. And so we're thinking about it like what tools are in our army tool case to go and actually do battle in each of those areas and, um, you know, like, so face coverings, for example, that is a way to go push on the case contact number and to push it down. Hospital readiness, you know, making sure we have the en enough PPE is a way to manage that. So testing, we want to approach in that same way. And we're really just starting to kind of get our arms around thinking about it, not just as the number of ki test kits that we need via the number of cases we have, but just a much more robust testing regimen. And then the other two that I mentioned uh, that you also uh, talked about were the case contacting. So uh, I think Patty uh, talked last time about the pilot um, that we're doing right now on case contacting. We are currently about to, we are able to do about 40 cases, um, a, I guess a day, um, not what the unit is, I believe it's a day. Um, and, and that is like hovering right around where we are right now. But the thing is, we need to be able to, we need to be able to do enough uh, case contact tracing so that when we see a spike for some reason, we can get in there and do it. We are, we are in a partnership with the state right now. And so what we can't do, they are doing. Um, but we really need that to be uh, robustly uh, a King County operation so that we can be nimble, be flexible and get in quickly. And then the third one uh, was around the um, high-risk facility outbreaks. And that's a challenge, obviously, because these are very vulnerable populations. But again, I think our management of those has been going in the right direction. We had several days where we didn't have any um, deaths in the homelessness community. We, uh, I, think, I think you all know we, in long-term care facilities, again, I wouldn't say it's a hole in the system, but I think we have all identified that there are gaps for sure um, in terms of how we as a community, and I don't just mean King County, I mean local jurisdictions, I mean the Area Agency um, on Aging, I mean uh, DSHS at the state, which licenses uh, long-term care facilities. We, we saw a vacuum there when there was uh, a public health crisis. And so um, we're getting our arms around that now, which is a good thing, but we need to really think about the ongoing infrastructure to support those facilities so that we don't continue to have outbreaks there that really um, 
cause the disease to spread in our community in a way that we, we could have otherwise gotten our arms around. So I guess um, I, I, I meant it to be quick and I thank you for the detailed answer, but I just a comment and maybe we can follow up later. It seems to me that in these areas where we need more capacity in order to continue to advance, part of our problem has been that we do not have the ability, we don't have control over the availability of testing kits, et cetera, or we don't have enough contact tracers and that's just, a, and so at some point I'd like to find out how much of this is now within our capability uh, versus how much are, we're still sort of a wing and a prayer and crossed fingers, right? Um, but let's move on because I, I, you've been here, you've been on the spot for a very long time. My second question is I, do, I also have been receiving the whatabouts. I like the, the way you put that. Uh, and just to uh, second some of my colleagues, I also heard from tennis centers and private uh, recreational facilities as to whether they will be able to open on the same footing as, as fitness centers. You know, if you can have somebody in a, in a fitness center on an elliptical trainer, why can't you have two people standing uh, 90 feet apart from each other on a tennis court. Um, and I'm not asking you to answer these, I'm just putting them into the, the, the list here. Uh, I've been hearing from uh, folks who care about swimming and I don't know if there are special epidemiological concerns because of the water, but beach clubs, swimming clubs. And uh, I think we all have been hearing from our hairdressers because they are missing us probably almost as much as we are missing them. So all of that has been, uh, has come to me as well. The idea that if I'm going to lose unemployment because I'm a sole contractor, uh, wouldn't it be better for me to wait to phase two? Um, I just hope that we can try to get to those what about questions at some point, because they mean a lot to the people who are asking them. And then my final question is actually more of a request. And that is um, when you have the uh, application for phase 1.5 altogether, and you share it with the council members as has been requested. I would love to join the Board of Health Chair and the Executive in signing on as the chair on behalf of the council so that we're sending a uni unified message from all of us, including the council, that we are very ready to move forward and to start uh, you know, uh, safely and in a healthy way opening up our, our economy here. So thank you for considering that. That is an outstanding idea and uh, I think makes a, a ton of sense and is uh, very one King County as we are. So thank you for that offer and uh, consider it accepted. <laughs> thank you. Further, seeing no further questions for Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, one quick one. Real quick. Yep. Um, do you have a list of South County, North County, East County, West County, of where the testing sites are um, that is on the public health website and where that is, if you could say that because I've been asked that a lot. And also you just said that 28 hospitals have to send in an email. Could we get like three or four hospitals and then tell the state that we'll be getting the others in the next couple of days so it doesn't slow the process down? So council member, I am so pleased to be able to give you good news. So one, we have that list, and so we'll send it to you and get it out. And actually, while we were sitting here, um, I just got the notice that I believe we have all of them. We have received all of them. So that's been, the team's been working really hard. And obviously, they are wonderful partners, and I think understand the, um, how, how urgent everybody feels about getting this done. So big thank you to all of them, and I think we are we are good. Thank you. With that, thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Mr. Dively. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, Dwight Dively, the Director of the Office of Performance Strategy and Budget. Um, it's, um, I guess it's always a pleasure to be here. I wish I had better news most of the time than I usually have. Uh, so let me, uh, given the interest of time, let me uh, cover five things here. I think the first one will probably be the most time consuming. So most of you are probably aware that we got the updated revenue forecast from our Office of Economic on Friday. Uh, Council Member Cole Wells, Council Member Lambert, uh, and I will be meeting as the Forecast Council on Thursday to adopt that. Um, I will draw attention to four things that are either in the forecast or are implicit in the forecast. Uh, the first one is national forecasters are predicting that in the second quarter of this year, the national gross domestic product will decline by something between 30 and 40%. Um, so if anyone has any doubts about the severity of the impact 
uh, a 30 to 40 percent decline in GDP is like totally unprecedented. Um, I just saw earlier today uh, a report from the Congressional Research Service that they don't expect the impacts of COVID and the economic recession uh, to be fully gone for a decade. So uh, we're in for some very, very serious times. Um, second point I'll make on the revenue forecast, uh, the sales tax forecast came in a little bit lower than had earlier been guessed at, not a lot, um, but the, the worst news I think in the sales tax forecast is the recovery is slower. So um, while the, it goes down a little bit more in 2020 and 2021, there's actually a significantly lower amount of sales tax revenue in 2022, which means we're coming out of the recession more slowly um, and means that future budgets are even more adversely affected. Uh, I was talking to Rob Gannon today at Metro and the impact over 10 years on their budget is something like another $250 million of revenue loss. Uh, so that's going to be very significant as we prepare the next budget. A uh, third thing in the revenue forecast I would mention is the lodging tax, which I think you all know starting in 2021, uh, that revenue accrues to the county. And you have uh, set some policies about how that would be allocated. Uh, there are very significant declines in the lodging tax forecast. Uh, in 2021, about 13 million less than had been planned. In 2022, about 10 million less. Uh, the forecast suggests it will take about five years uh, before we get back to 2019 levels of lodging tax. Uh, so that has some very serious consequences on the programs that would be funded from that revenue source. And then finally, one that I admit I had not expected, um, there is a significant hit to the emergency medical services property tax levy. Um, interestingly, not so much in 2021, but in subsequent years, and for 2022 to 2025, that cumulative total is about $46 million. And the reason for that is the way that ballot measure was written, it has a maximum tax rate written into it. And uh, because assessed value is growing more slowly than expected, that levy is projected to hit that tax rate and therefore not collect as much revenue has been planned. Now, the good news is the folks in the emergency medical service program believe that because of the reserves that have been set up and some other factors, they actually think that that's manageable for the county and for the entities that uh, get revenue from us. Uh, but many of you will recall that the city of Seattle gets a direct allocation of that property tax and the reserves that we have set up do not support them. So it is likely that that will be a further revenue hit for the city of Seattle. And uh, Dave Reich from OEFA reached out to them yesterday to make sure they were aware of that potential problem. Uh, there's obviously lots more information in the revenue forecast, but I thought those were four things that I would call to your attention. And as usual, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this point. Colleagues. Up the Grove. Councilmember Upgrove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Dwight. Uh, I think this is repetitive from a question last week, but with the updated numbers, any additional thought to beginning to make adjustments in the middle of this year uh, beyond perhaps just the mid fund? Or is this all, are we really going to, uh, and will the, will the meat of this be addressed in, our, in the recommendations coming for next year's budget? Yeah, so I think for most funds, the meat of it is going to be in the 2021-2022 budget. Um, certainly for the mid funds, as I think all of you know, we're looking at making reductions sooner. Uh, Metro is looking at making reductions as soon as their September service change. And so those are the two funds that are most dependent on the sales tax and therefore actually are the ones that are going sooner. Um, many of the departments have... Um, maybe what you could call an informal hiring freeze where many positions are being held vacant. Um, some of the other departments are looking at ways they can save money this year as kind of a down payment on their future budget cuts. So while we're not formally running a mid-year budget process for most of our funds, in effect, many of them are actually doing that. Thanks. Zahalai. 
Council Member Zahavad. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Dwight, as well. Dwight, before the world fell apart, you and I were talking about how to get uh, marginalized communities to have more of a say on the budgeting process to set their priorities. And we had plans of holding community town halls and workshops to help people know how they can advocate for themselves in the budgeting process. Now, obviously, the whole playbook is out of the window um, and we have to rethink how we set priorities. Are there still ways for people out in the community to have a say in the budgeting process? Is there a way for us to have a participatory budgeting process? I know during the COVID omnibus budgeting periods, the, the timelines have been very short and you know it's mostly been council members having us weighing in on the executive's budget. But could you speak a little bit to what opportunities we have, what we could do to uh, make sure people have a say because those communities that we were talking about before, their concerns are more important now than ever rather than less. Thank you. So let me give you two answers, council member. One's a process answer and one's a policy answer. So the process answer is um, obviously in the near term, we can't convene any kind of large community meeting in the way that we had discussed. Um, I think frankly, for the entire course of the summer while the executive's developing the proposed budget, uh, that's not going to be possible. But what we can do um, is we could try to find virtual ways to do that. And I would be happy to work with you or with any of your colleagues uh, to set up uh, virtual meetings in whatever way works with a particular constituency or particular district uh, to provide for that kind of input. Um, I think, as you said, it's more important now than ever. The uh, policy thing I would note, and this is really, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of the executive here, is you know the events of the last um, week or maybe perhaps a little longer uh, clearly need, show the need for us to redouble, retriple our efforts uh, toward racial justice, towards having a budget that reflects our priorities, uh, towards things that will fundamentally change how we can deliver services in this county so uh, despite the you know, serious lack of money, I think we have to think of new ways that we're gonna do things differently and provide some resource to support those communities. Um, and I would welcome you know, over the next two months, let's say any input that any of you have about how we can do that. Um, as we've communicated with departments about changes to their budgets, we have encouraged them to think in different ways and not just assume we have to continue every process we've always had, um, and just do less of it. Um, let's do some things that we don't, let, let's stop doing some things. Let's do some things completely differently and maybe there's a way to free up some resources to address some long um, unaddressed needs. Uh, so that maybe was a long answer to your question, but I do wanna put out uh, both to, to all of you, the uh, willingness of my office and certainly myself to participate in any way with your communities that we can um, in the budget development process. Thank you so much, Dwight. We'll be in touch soon. Appreciate you. Great. Councilmember Dombowski. Don. I'm, I'm sorry. Councilmember Dunn is next and then Councilmember Dombowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, um, I'm getting some mixed signals from those of my friends in the real estate uh, business uh, concerned about some of the long-term effects. Is your analysis uh, and projections still thinking that the real estate market is going to be relatively unscathed. And if not, uh, do you have some concerns for levy suppression in years one, two, and three? Yeah, council member, I think there's two different answers to your question. So clearly the commercial real estate market is not going to be nearly as strong as it has been in recent years. Uh, with all the changes in how people are working, with the changes in the hospitality industry, uh, there clearly is going to be a downturn in commercial real estate. I think it's obvious there is. Uh, the forecasts that uh, came out on Friday assume that commercial property values will decline for a while. Um, on the residential side so far, interestingly, um, prices have held up pretty well. Sales are down a little bit, but nothing like we saw in the Great Recession. So the uh, assessed value forecast is actually still reasonably positive, and the probability of levy proration is still pretty low. 
Um, I actually have one of my staff doing um, a, a map, which he sent me, which I haven't had time to look at, frankly, in the last few days, uh, to try to identify where that might be a possibility. And as you know, it it typically occurs um, in small areas of the Snoqualmie Valley, some of the areas outside of Enumclaw, uh, the Vashon Island area. So we're updating that, uh, but generally we don't see a big issue so far with levy proration. Yeah, keep me posted. It, it, it is as I'm worried. I guess I'm more worried about it than than perhaps others. But that issue, if it does rear its head, uh, especially with the commercial side, combined with an EMS levy shortfall or maximized reserves, and how those two might combine to create a more significant problem. Will do. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Dombowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, thanks for this update. They're always helpful. Um, since we last met, the executive issued or declared a budget emergency, uh, I guess I'll, I'll call it. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what powers that uh, places in the executive branch, um, what the implications are, and uh, maybe what you see um, the next steps under that declaration being and how council should or sh will or will not be involved. That's great. You have uh, given me a perfect lead to the second thing I want okay. to this, uh, this afternoon. So um, a declaration of budget emergency is required under the county code before um, executive leaders, and I'll define that in a minute, can do things like furlough employees, change office hours, change days of operation, and things like that. Uh, the executive declares such an emergency, which he did last Friday, and then the council has to ratify that declaration. So we have transmitted an ordinance that I believe will be on your agenda next Tuesday for the council to ratify that proclamation of budget emergency. Uh, once that occurs, the power to do these kind of things um, accrues to whoever the, the, in essence, the executive is of various agencies. So for all the true executive departments, the county executive is given that power. For the separately elected officials, so the assessors, the courts, the prosecutor's office, the elections director, um, and, and uh, the sheriff, they have that power within their own agencies. And for the council agencies, the council chair would have that power. So that's what it does. And the council will clearly have a role in uh, deciding whether to go ahead with that proclamation. Uh, thank you, Dwight. And echoing council member Zahalai's um, points, which you affirmed, I think um, I'd like to give some special attention to making sure that uh, we look out for communities that are often left out and left behind and as we undertake these uh, presumably cuts, right, and some draconian cuts, mm -hmm. um, and that the emergency powers um, make, don't um, eliminate our, or substantially reduce our transparency and visibility on the decision-making and the work we've done to bring forward disadvantaged communities and organizations and, mm -hmm. and residents. Yeah. One last thing I should note is that the emergency declaration does not override labor contracts. So anything that would be done with represented employees would still require bargaining. Great. Uh, just a, a final thought on that. And I just would like to surface this, this idea. I haven't really advanced it, but with respect to our employees, I, I think some tough times are coming there and we're probably gonna have a smaller workforce this time next year than we do today. And we have a history in the county of really generous um, employee giving, and we have a formal employee giving program. And I, I wonder if we could talk and look about uh, setting up an account to help uh, our own family members, our own county family members who may lose jobs and have special needs um, to where uh, we could have an account in our employee giving program to support those needs. That's a, Council Member, that's an idea that um, I certainly have not heard before, although probably somebody else has already thought of it. Let me make sure I pass that on to the employee giving uh, people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Council Member Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, also, with regard to what Councilmember Zahulai brought out, I second that. And I just want to bring up that before or pre-COVID, I had met with all of my colleagues on the council and as budget chair. And finding out what their preferences would be in terms of the process for uh, our biennial budget work. And I've had those discussions with you as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, for the third upcoming, uh, the, the third uh, COVID budget emergency supplemental budget, uh, we had the second one uh, three weeks ago go through the council. Uh, but we have uh, been able to provide to you through a motion and other materials that we did that last week at the council meeting, uh, the po policy priorities of our members mm -hmm. and provided you with categories and, and so forth. And I intend that we are going to continue doing that for each COVID budget. We've talked about that, but also for the biennial budget. And when I talked with individuals before COVID struck, uh, we had talked about having town halls uh, that could be individual members holding them in their districts, or we could have them uh, throughout the county uh, as a council. And we also had talked about having panels on significant policy issues that we had agreed upon and have those during the summer. Uh, rather than wait till the budget is transmitted late September. And um, I would like to work with you all to be sure that we provide as much as much mm -hmm. our priorities as possible. And one of the things I communicated to all of the, my colleagues last Friday in an email was that we would be getting to the executive by the end of June, our major policy priorities and principles for the biennial budget coming up in the fall. I'd like to hear from you, Dwight, on you know how that would work best for you. Um, is that something that the executive is still interested in our participation in developing the budget and so forth? Yeah, so I, I think um, not only are we still interested, I think it's fair to say we are more interested. Um, okay. As the situation becomes more dire, the number of places around the budget that we're going to have to look for significant changes and reductions and such is growing. And so the sooner that we can have thoughts from council members about um, services that we should prioritize, uh, services that maybe we need to shrink or discontinue entirely, um, ways that we might organize to be more efficient, um, the, all of that will be very, very valuable. And, and please don't confine yourselves just to the general fund. Um, you know, we're going to have effects in public health. We're going to have effects in human services. We clearly have major effects in Metro. Uh, we have effects on smaller programs like historic preservation. Uh, I didn't mention it, but, you know, the youth sports grant program is funded entirely by the rental car tax, which is going to be down by 50%. Uh, so the ability to do the kind of programs we've done historically there will not exist. So think about what all your priorities are, not just general fund, and any ideas that you can share. And we are welcome, uh, to, we welcome that information in whatever form is convenient, whether council member, it's just at the end of the day, you and I talking about it, it's sending me a long email, whether it's a formal motion, um, any of that kind of input would be most helpful. Thank you. And our COVID leadership team meets this Thursday. So I will be discussing this all with them too. And right. of course, reaching out to all council members. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Dively? I've got three more things. Please go ahead. Okay. So council member Cole Wells gave me a little lead into this one. So uh, we are still planning to transmit the third COVID uh, supplemental Appropriations Ordinance on June 11th. Um, this one's fairly comprehensive. It has uh, quite a bit of proposed funding for public health, uh, significant continuations and expansion of testing and contact tracing. Uh, we have a series of technology investments, particularly in the court system to help the courts recover. Uh, we are responding to some of the ideas you had in your motion 
Uh, we're trying to work through the details right now of a food security proposal, for example, which if memory serves was the highest priority on the council's list. Uh, so we um, are basically done with decision-making. We're doing all the, the detailed work to get that uh, over to you on June 11th. Um, I do wanna bring up one thing that I mentioned before um, that is in there, but is different than everything else. So we've talked about the impact on the permitting fund in the Department of Local Services, and the executive will be proposing $1 million of general fund to uh, backfill part of the revenue loss in permitting. And we think that with that money and with uh, using some permitting staff to support uh, upcoming work of other departments, we can probably maintain that staff for the rest of this year and be prepared if, as we hope, we see some resurgence in uh, permitting activity in the unincorporated area. Uh, I just wanna make sure you understand that there is no possibility today of using federal money to uh, backfill for that. So it, we should expect that it is either a general fund grant or a general fund loan. Um, and I just wanted to call attention to that one because it will be different and it will really be calling on you to make a policy choice that at least in my 10 years, uh, we have never done before. Uh, the rest of it should all seem fairly familiar. It's all likely supported by federal funds in various ways. Tim Bowski. Councilmember Tim Bowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Dwight, on that, um, is that the, will that be the ordinance that appropriates out the 262 million CARES Act funding? So the way we're doing it, council member, is we are asking for appropriations of funds in various um, funds. So whether it's the public health fund or the general fund or the permitting fund. And we are, um, in most cases, a little agnostic yet about where the backfill is coming from. Um, our goal is to maximize how much FEMA reimbursement we get before we tap the CARES Act fund. So um, implicitly, in most cases, we will be, be able to tell you whether we think it's FEMA eligible, in which case probably 25% is coming from the CARES Act money. Or in some cases, we will be reasonably confident it is not FEMA eligible, in which case it's probably all coming from the CARES Act money. There are a few other things in there that are separate grants, uh, particularly for public health, that do not come from FEMA and do not come from CARES Act. So um, we won't know for certain about how much of the CARES Act money is we're using, but we have a pretty good sense uh, of which ones we think are FEMA eligible and which ones we don't. Oh, okay, that's helpful. So, so say a council member had a, an idea within one of the priorities, say food security, um, and, and I'll just surface this. It came out of a conversation I had this week with a frontline food bank volunteer, uh, Councilmember Zahalai, in your district, in the Central District. She reached out um, to perhaps do an investment, which we haven't done in our Fresh Bucks program here in the county. The Conservation mm -hmm. District funds it, the Seattle Beverage Tax funds it, but it would put basically it's a, it's like a snap, put a local voucher in people's hands to buy fresh food on their own that's culturally appropriate and. Um, might be a might be a program we could invest in with uh, that's consistent with our food security priority in response to the COVID deal. It, it, to work on that kind of an idea, will there be time to do that with colleagues and the executive, um, or, or are those things going to be fully fleshed out in your proposal? Um, so your specific example is coincidentally one of the things that we are looking at. Um, let's assume that that's one of our proposals, then we're aligned. If for whatever reason we decide to go in a different direction with food, it's always something that the council could certainly amend, um, either redirect some money we're proposing or add money. Uh, that's a case where we know it is not FEMA eligible, but it is definitely CARES Act eligible. Um, the, the schedule that you use to review and adopt the supplemental is, of course, up to you. Um, and so we need action, you know, reasonably quickly because we need the appropriation authority. But if the council wanted to add another week for your consideration, um, that's not uh, a problem really for the executive. Thank you. Lambert? No, council member Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, so on the permitting issue, um, I know that they're at least four months behind in their caseload. So catching up could help us to get the revenue. So I think that's really important. And I know that there are some um, large enterprises that have been waiting. So um, and I'm glad that we can keep that and hopefully the pipeline. Um, I think you might want to check with our ag department on just what um, the previous speaker said. Um, I think that they are working on something very similar as a pilot project right now with our uh, Snohomish County. So you might want to ask them what they're doing on that pilot project because they've been doing it for about a month and a half. Um, so they may need, because we're partnering with Snohomish County, I don't know if we need to buy our own license or what happens if the pilot's existing. So you might want to ask them and see if they can let you know on that, that it may be easier to get done than we thought, it, but it might have a price tag. Um, and then sure. sec secondly, the school lunch money program is supposed to end June 15th, but we want it, of course, to go until September. And last night I spoke with Congresswoman Del Benny, and she said that that is being taken care of in the HEROES Act and that they didn't think until this week that the HEROES Act was going to make it through the Senate. She believes now that there is action um, coming in the Senate. So that part might be something we can watch to see about getting more food for the kids through October through that. So I hope those are two good news. Yeah, that, that is good. That's I had not heard that latter point particularly. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Dively, anything further? Yeah, so two other quick things. And I think these are very quick. So um, on Friday, as I had uh, let you know ahead of time, we did transmit to almost all agencies that get general fund resources um, a request that they identify 5% budget reductions for 2021 and a further 5% for 2022. So essentially 7.5% uh, reductions in their straight general fund appropriation. So in cases where um, uh, an agency has grant money or other funding sources, uh, we withdrew that from the calculation. So we're really only focused on the true general fund resources that they receive. We also, for agencies that don't really have any control over their inputs, we acknowledged that and said, we're only asking you to identify cuts on things that essentially are optional. Um, and so they have smaller targets as a result. Um, there are lots of other things we're working on centrally in addition to that. Uh, so those targets alone don't fill the whole gap, but um, unfortunately, as the news continues to get worse, I think it's going to be more and more likely that we have to take most, if not all, of those 7.5% uh, reductions in the proposed budget. Thank you. Councilmember Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, uh, you were going to, or the executive was going to transmit the uh, biennial third supplemental omnibus budget last Friday, and that's been delayed. Do you have an update on when that will be coming over? And my colleagues, we do not need to act on that right away. We're looking more at July into August. Yeah, there were a couple of things that uh, we wanted to run by the executive in more detail. And so uh, my current understanding, it's either going to be transmitted to you this week or more likely next week. Further questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, comments, uh, we as a branch are of course not exempt from this uh, budget situation that the county finds ourselves in. And so I've uh, been working with our chief of staff and our administrator to come up with some, uh, I guess what ifs is what I would call them, what it would look like if we uh, take on a level of cuts similar to what Dwight is talking about. So we have to uh, start having some discussions amongst ourselves about what we're going to propose for the legislative branch budget. I just wanted you to know that we had begun looking at that. We're going to talk to you all and to uh, to our staff about it through our own internal process, but uh, that we've begun having just internal conversations. We will have to make some hard decisions as well. So it's going to be a hard year all the way around, I believe, And uh, but we're all, we're all in it uh, together. So I'll just say I appreciate that fact that the council is is having those conversations. It does send an important signal to the rest of the government. 
All right, the very last thing I thought I would share, um, and this is just another indicator that we are now operating in a very different world than we were three or four months ago. Um, you might recall early on in these briefings, I gave you an update when we got our uh, excess liability insurance renewed and our premium went up and our coverage went down, but we thought we did actually pretty well. We kept a fairly high degree of coverage. Uh, we ended up uh, with $67.5 million of insurance and we paid $3.8 million to get that. Um, our uh, friends across the street at the city of Seattle, uh, their insurance renewal was yesterday and uh, they uh, encountered a much more difficult market. And so the city of Seattle now um, has only $35 million of insurance and they paid $7 million to get it. So um, a 20% premium on your insurance is a pretty high premium. So uh, that just gives us a signal that uh, that world has changed a lot, probably is gonna continue to be that way for a while. Um, our property insurance, not our liability insurance, but our property insurance uh, expires at the end of this month, it renews on July 1st. Uh, the folks in risk management are working hard on that. Um, I suspect we will see a significant increase in premium and perhaps um, uh, less coverage than we've had historically. So uh, I just wanted to give you a, a heads up that that uh, part of the whole financial system is also under incredible stress. Done. Cast member done. done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, uh, you're to be commended for moving so quickly on, on purchasing at liability insurance, and that is a significant concern downstream for for us in, in terms of the budget impact. Is there any discussion at all in Olympia, as far as you know, about any kind of limitation of liability to local governments at this time? Um, so first of all, let me say that I have nothing to do with insurance um, other than sitting on the committee that approves it. So the congratulations belong to our Office of Risk Management, uh, Jennifer Hills and Allison Frey, who are the leads for that. And they they truly are outstanding. Jennifer has actually received national awards as the outstanding public sector uh, risk manager. So uh, they have saved this county uh, literally tens of millions of dollars over the years uh, through their great work. So I get credit for what they've done. Um, Council Member, I am not aware of discussions uh, going I suspect there are because certainly the state also has liabilities, um, but I have not been tracking that to see uh, what potential legislation might be being considered. Thank you. Further questions of Mr. Dively? Thank you very much, Mr. Dively. We You're welcome. Your briefing as always. And um, with that, we move to public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone on the line wishing to provide public comment? Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. I assumed as much. Um, having an entirely remote meeting is unusual, though becoming more usual for the County Council. And I do want to be sure that everyone who has called in understands the rules for public comment and how the process will be managed. First, our standard ground rules. Um, public comment must be related to items on today's meeting agenda and must not be used for the purposes of assisting a campaign for election of any person to any office or for the promotion or opposition of any ballot measures. It um, also must not include obscene speech. If a speaker fails to abide by these restrictions, I may rule their speaker out of order and require the speaker to exit the virtual meeting. Now I'll describe the process itself. As members of the public could join the meeting, they were automatically muted. We can see your name or the last three digits of your telephone number. Our committee clerk will call the names and numbers. When your name or last three digits of your phone number is called, staff will unmute your line. Make sure you have also unmuted um, your phone if you have muted as a courtesy during the meeting. Before you begin your testimony, please wait to be acknowledged so we can be sure we can hear you and start by saying and spelling your name so we capture it accurately for the record. If you wish your video to be turned on for your public comment, please request that before beginning. You'll have two minutes to speak, and when you'll hear a timer go off at the end of two minutes. We'll ask you to wrap up your thought um, and allow the next person to speak. Um, if you're listening on the TV or streaming, please turn that function off uh, when you're offering testimony or we'll hear feedback. 
Um, with that, um, Madam Clerk, uh, it, once you have finished your testimony, I'd invite you to monitor the rest of the meeting uh, by watching um, King County TV channel 22 or streaming online at um, www.kingcounty.gov backslash council and clicking on the watch us live button. Um, with that, we'll move into public comment and I'll ask um, the clerk to begin calling names and numbers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first caller on the line is Brogan Thompson. Go ahead, please, Mr. Thompson, you are unmuted. Okay, can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, we can, please proceed. Okay, and yeah, you can put my video on if you want, but uh, my name is Brogan Thompson, that's B-R-O-G-A-N, last name T-H-O-M-S-E-N. And um, I've just we've got a comment on the eviction ban and it seems to like it's uh, gonna include um, some tenants that won't might not comply with some of the other uh, rules in my lease agreement, rather than just the uh, COVID related payments. I have a, a, a couple issues with some tenants and I'd rather not have some of the, uh, you know, if they damage the place or if they smoke, you know, it's a non-smoking building for instance. And it looks like according to my sources, it's a little hard to read all the, all the text of your proposal. And it looks like the eviction ban, I won't be able to give 10 day notices or anything like that for, for some of the other rules besides rent paying. Uh, basically the ban, you know, I think is a good idea in most cases, but I don't think it should cover those uh, other rules that I, I run, you know, it's a fourplex, very small, small thing. And, but sometimes we have some problems. So anyway, I was hoping that could get uh, edited out or an amendment or something if, if that's really the case it's hard to hard for me to track exactly what what's going to apply that's that's about all I had to say uh, thank you thank you Mr. Thompson the next caller on the line is Dinah Braccio go ahead Ms. Braccio you are muted Hi, uh, my name is Dina Braccio. That's D-I-N-A-H. Last name is B-R-A-C-C-I-O. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm calling about um, some proposed legislation to um, provide protections for tenants, um, sort of beyond the scope of the immediate uh, eviction moratoriums, and that. Um, specifically, like giving folks long uh, a re a good amount of time to repay like their lost rent, and I just really want to encourage the council that any legislation like that will need to have some form of a just cause provision um, to prevent uh, circumnavigation of that by terminating a tenancy. Uh, without cause and therefore like bypassing any of the pay or vacate um, orders. Um, and I would also just like to, uh, to emphasize my support for provisions of the proposed eviction ban that do include 10 day notices. And that cause often we have, um, we have seen that those have been given out to tenants uh, as, as pretense for for either the non-payment of rent or um, for legitimate disagreements or attempts to enforce their rights as tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Braccio. The next caller on the line is Elena Brook. Go ahead, Ms. Brook, you are unmuted. Ms. Brooke, I'm <clears throat> for some reason not allowed to unmute your iPad. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, great, thank you. Okay, yes. I'm sorry, I did not, you know, it, it's a, such a short notice, so I wasn't prepared for that. 
But anyway, what I'm trying to say that um, I'm kind of reading, and I was expecting the 5th of uh, June to become the date eligible, uh, make us eligible to um, kind of go after the uh, tenants who are not paying their bills. And I'm on the same boat with them. You know, they suffering from uh, the virus and they lost the jobs. So, so same thing with me. I'm living in a triplex. It's an owner occupied. Uh, my son lives in one unit. I live in the other unit. And uh, um, I, we have a rental, one rental. And those people stop paying. And they're very happy because they can not pay and they're not responsible for anything. And I am getting small um, 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 kind of a social security and pension. And it's, what, it's my investment. I'm so surprised that city council, which never put any money to my investment, can manage my investment and force me to accept people live free. This is not, not fair. So you only one-sided. You think that those 10, all of them, we all have different stories. This is my investment. I work for it very hard. I have to pay taxes. I have to pay insurances. I have to maintain the building. I'm responsible and liable for somebody who will fall up next to my building. And I have to deal with it. And the tenants not. They live free of rent. They don't have to worry about to repay it. You give them so, so many rights. And only the owners have responsibilities. You actually are getting salaries because we pay taxes you using public money for the salaries and how about if i'll ask you stop getting paid or get some ten my tenants to live one with one of you it's just a human you know i ran away from soviet union hoping that this are you still listening or not i kind of okay you know, I ran away over 50 years from Soviet Union because of the communism. Socialism was putting us all down as people, as human. We had no rights. I finally came to United States free country. I worked very hard. I worked three jobs to save my money. I finished up college and school. And I was working all my life. And I saved something for my golden years. I had a surgery in October. I had a heart infection. I was treated for so whole months. I have a problem with my health now. I'm over 70. I can't work. I do not really want to pay for somebody's rent. Can you help me to pay my taxes? Can you help me to pay my insurances? Can you forfeit all my obligations and just let me Live free until you will decide that this memorandum is finished. No, you're not. You're trying to just force me to accept people. Young people live in one of that unit. They don't pay. They smoke dope every day. Ms. Brooke, I'm sorry your time is up. Can you please wrap up? Okay, wrap up. I'm telling you, you have to be not one-sided. One I'm a small owner. And owner actually occupied my family live in this building. We're only renting one apartment. It's my golden years. I saved this money for to supplement my, my social security and my income. And now I have to pay for, for somebody who just, you know, QFC and other store have lots of positions available. People do not want to apply because they're sitting home. They're getting money from government constantly. And they just keeping their money for themselves and enjoying life while I'm suffering. I have to buy my insulin. I have to buy other medications. It costs a lot of money, everything. Go to the doctors and everything. I'm an emergency in and out. Who's going to help me? Thank I'm safe. So I work hard. I want you to listen and treat me as a senior, as a citizen, as a person equal to my tenant. In Ms. Ms. Brooke? Ms. Brooke, we appreciate your testimony, but I am going to ask you to conclude so we can hear from other people who want to testify. I want to also say that this is unfair. This is called discrimination. You're discriminating me and you're putting my tenants ahead of me. I'm okay. 74. Thank I you, for, th thank, you for your, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. We're glad to have, um, be able to hear your testimony. Ms. Daly? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Our next caller, and please forgive me, this is how you show up on my screen. It's Feliciang, F-E-L-I-C-I-N-A-N-G. You are unmuted. You are muted on my end, but it looks like you are still muted yourself. So if you want to unmute and speak, that would be great. It appears that she is still muted on Zoom. I, I'm not able to unmute her. I think she has or he has to do it. But why don't we move on and I'll try to come back to that person. So the next caller on the line is Kelly Price. Hey. Please go ahead. You are muted. Or... Once again, I'm trying to unmute and Kelly Price. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I had to fight with the unmute button. Um, Thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly Price, K-E-L-L-E-Y-P-R-I-C-E. -E -E. I own uh, one rental home and I am very concerned that you guys are, extend, are, are considering extending, allowing tenants to stay without paying rent. We had a tenant, we have a tenant in the house in the house and he, he's been a, a pretty poor tenant kind of all along his he doesn't pay his rent on time he he doesn't pay the utilities and then we get the bills he uh, doesn't take good care of the house and then uh, his lease was up the end of march and we were going to have him out you know okay your lease is up bye bye and then this thing hit and you guys said we couldn't do it take him out and he's sitting there and he's he's still working at least part-time. We know that there's lots of resources for tenants. Probably on unemployment, he's, he's doing okay, but he's not making the least bit of effort to pay even a partial rent. He's not responding to our attempts to contact him. And I feel like if you continue this through September, you're writing him a check out of my checkbook. And I really, you're not giving any kind of relief to homeowners. We've worked all our lives, as the previous lady said, to afford to have a single rental property. And it's part of our retirement fund. And, you know, we're not giving us a break on the taxes. The mortgage holder is not, you know, saying, oh, you don't have to pay your mortgage. I really feel like that, you know, you're, you're going too far. And, and it's, I actually, it's getting close to being a violation of the taking of private property. And I think that pretty much covers it. Thank you, Ms. Price, um, for your comments. The next caller on the line is Kurt Krager. Mr. Krager, can you unmute yourself, please, and go ahead? Okay, yes. Uh Good afternoon. I'm Kurt Krager. That's K-U-R-T-K-R-E-A-G-E-R. -E -E I'm speaking to you from Bellevue, Washington. First to the whole council, thank you for tackling the very important issue of renter protections. We certainly are all in uncharted territory in these last few months. I'm speaking as a King County resident, a King County landlord, as well as an advisor to uh, other local landlords. While the intention of this legislation is very well intended, the actual effects will result in far different incomes than intended. You will actually be hurting the very renters if you are trying to protect. First, most landlords I know are selling any property that they have if and when it becomes empty, particularly single family houses. The end result is fewer and fewer rental units, tenants having fewer choices, and the resulting increase in housing costs due to scarcity. I can speak directly to this as I know of multiple King County and a few Snohomish County units in the last few months that have sold under those circumstances. Second, I also do not see how allowing and even encouraging tenants to fall behind is in their best interests. Most residents will be unaffected. They will pay their rent, or work out arrangements without being forced to. Matter of fact, several landlords I know proactively reduce rent to a level that covers the costs 
before any law made them do it. It's actually the tenants on the edge, the ones you're trying to protect that'll be hurt the most. A better solution is to immediately prioritize rental housing assistance, funding uh, funding that helps those you say or you're trying to protect. Also, as addressed by a few of the previous uh, speakers, tenant rules violation evictions need to be addressed. Rules violations burden neighbors and even create safety issues if we're not able to remove dangerous tenants from the uh, from the property. Any restriction must be crafted with stakeholder input. To put the entire burden on landlords and other residents who do not pay their rent is unfair. Do not forget the foreclosure crisis and what happened back then. Many landlords are like you and I. They've lost jobs, they've lost businesses. They're like the lady uh, previous to me. It's her only house. <clears throat> I am suggesting the following. Vote no today and or delay this legislation until, in, until stakeholders, including the RHA or other landlords like myself can be included. Immediately seek funding and establish a rental assistance funding program to help those in need with rental assistance. Set your minimum rent reduction to no more than 25%. An example, maximum rent is 75% of the actual rent. That'll go a long way to helping uh, owners continue to pay their mortgage. Shorten the time to repay to no more than four months from the time they modify or begin not paying their rent. That's sufficient time for them to make long-term plans depending on whatever their personal circumstances dictate. Also pass legislation that uh, will allow any landlord who can show impact from reduced rents to delay property tax payments be on the little bit of relief we got through June. Mr. Craiger, you're two minutes yes. declared. If I can ask you to wrap up. Okay, I, yeah, I, I'm in my last paragraph. Please solve Quickly, the problem please. by inviting stakeholders into the process, not create a bigger one for the very people you say you're trying to help. Like one council member said at the beginning of the meeting, as a council, you must come up with strategic solutions, not just take the easy path. Thank you. Okay. Lambert? Council Member Lambert, we're in public testimony. I know, I'd just like to ask for a copy of his comments. Mr. Kreger, if you could email a copy of your comments to Council Member Lambert, she would appreciate it. Ms. Daly? Yes, yes I will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the next caller on the line is Isaac Organista. You are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you very much, Council. Thank you, um, first and foremost, for recognizing the severity of the situation of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's very important, so I appreciate that. Um, my name is Isaac Organista. I'm an organizer here in Seattle and King County. I'm a renter as well, and I'm a member of the Latinx community, and I'm also a child of immigrants. So I've seen how my community, especially undocumented folks, have been severely impacted by this pandemic. People have lost their jobs, and if they're undocumented, they can't, cannot access state or federal support. And folks are behind on rent. So evictions, as we know, evictions are the number one cause of homelessness, and with this pandemic affecting black and brown people more, not ensuring folks the stability of their homes during this pandemic and sending them to the streets would be sending them to their deaths. All of COVID cases in of all out of all of the COVID cases in Washington, 39% of them are from Latinx folks, even though we make up 13% of the state population. I've had conversations with people in Kirkland, Issaquah, Redmond, worrying about what will happen once the moratorium ends. Council, if this ordinance doesn't include both non-possessory and good cause protections, you might as well not do anything. Don't just pass something to say you pass something. If you want to ensure folks can stay housed from apartments to manufactured homes, you need to include both of these things. One without the other will not protect tenants from no cause evictions. Non-possessory without good cause will not protect tenants from no cause evictions. Good cause without non-possessory means landlords will evict folks from not paying rent when we know they couldn't. Again, a lot of these issues have existed before the pandemic. COVID just exacerbated everything. It is high time for our elected officials, 
who have said themselves in this call that these problems have existed before while they've been in office to finally create tangible changes. And again, no cause is the smart thing to do. It will allow, um, allow for landlords and to evict tenants for property damages and et cetera, and other things like that. It has been implemented in other cities here in the state. So again, please pass this to, to ensure that it's including both non-possessory and good cause protections. Thank you, Mr. Organista. Our next caller on the line is Susan Smith. I've tried to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. My name is Susan Smith, S-U-S-A-N, S-M-I-T-H. And I'm a landlord and I agree with what all the other landlords have been saying. Um, I, to me, this is like commandeering my property and deciding and telling me what I can and can't do with it. It seems unconstitutional to me. It's the same as saying to a farmer right now, we have people that can't afford your produce. You need to bring your produce to the grocery store and if they can't pay, just give them the produce. And in a couple of months, um, they'll be able to pay you, maybe. That's exactly what you're saying to me. And I understand that as a state, you feel for these people and you wanna help them, then, but you're saying basically coming up to me, a stranger and saying, we feel bad for these tenants, you give them free rent for now. So what the state needs to do is you need to pay their rent. You need to set up a system. And if they can't pay it, then you pay the landlord. You don't come to an individual and say, give away your property for free. And if you read your, your what's being suggested, it is very unclear on the paying back. That it's, I'm already confused. It already doesn't make sense. I've had tenants that haven't paid April I try to set up a plan with them, but then it comes May and they can't pay May. So the whole payment plan is already null and void. And now comes June, they can't pay June. They Well, they say they can't pay. Like I have a young, you don't, as they've said, 65% I think of people are making more money than they were making before on unemployment. So, there needs to be some sort of verification too that they're not getting unemployment when they say they can't pay. Like I have a LifeWise, my insurance says they'll help only if I'm not getting a tax credit subsidy. There needs to be something like that. People can't just say they can't pay. Um, also, you're setting these people up to get, um, to fail. So when all of a sudden they do need to pay, they have three months of payment or four months how are they ever gonna pay the rent that they can probably barely pay, plus pay their four months or five months catch up? They won't be able to, and then they will be evicted. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith that's, that's the timer for your two minutes. If I could ask you to please conclude. Okay. One last thing, what's gonna happen? Are landlords are gonna sell their properties? You know, who's gonna buy it? Big corporations. And then do you think that they're gonna, their rents are gonna be even more and create more homelessness. So you're not helping the system and it's unfair to landlords. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Next caller on the line is Corey Brewer. Go ahead, Mr. Brewer. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can. Corey Brewer, C-O-R-Y-B-R-E-R. I'm the general manager at Windermere Property Management. We represent over a thousand single family landlords in King County. <clears throat> I'd like to echo several things said uh, by the landlords who have called in so far today. Um, first priority, I think, should be some type of rental assistance program for people who are struggling to meet their everyday expenses, including rent. Um, if that can be achieved, then all the other things we're talking about um, kind of go away. Uh, so that should be priority number one. Uh, we've heard from a lot of small mom and pop landlords who are the primary clientele that we represent. I think there is a major misconception out there about who a landlord is. They are not all these huge corporations. There are a lot of everyday hardworking people 
um, who happen to own a rental property, and uh, that serves as potentially their primary source of income. Um, and it's important not to forget that. Uh, I have a huge problem with what I see going on here. The attempt at a solution is a blanket policy, and blanket policy does not work. You have got to create targeted solutions um, aimed at helping the people that actually need the help. There are absolutely lots of people out there who desperately need help, and I think we can all agree on that. Um, any form of um, uh, leniency on someone's lease obligations should be predicated on them being able to demonstrate a COVID-19 related hardship. Um, and that all speaks to someone's ability to pay rent. That does not speak to someone's ability to follow the rules in their lease. And that part needs to be, be written out completely. That, that shouldn't even be part of the discussion today. Um, if someone is breaking the rules of their lease, they should not get a free pass. Um, and fortunately, you know, we, at least with our clients, we don't run into a whole lot of that. But when we do, it's a huge problem. And ultimately, the, the homeowner, that I should say, not the landlord, not the homeowner, the housing provider, because that's what they are. The housing provider is the one to end up holding the bag. And the more of these types of rules that get passed that are completely one-sided, um, it's true. Landlords are selling, and it's true. When they sell their properties, they are either purchased, primarily the single-family world that I'm working in, they are purchased by someone who um, is going to live in it themselves. So there is one less uh, unit of housing, rental housing inventory available that drives up the price of the remaining housing stock. And um, it is a very unique, it's a very unique uh, property type that we represent here with the single family housing world, Mr. as opposed- Brewer, yes. if I could ask you to conclude? Sure, as opposed to, the, to these large corporations that do own thousands of apartment units and can absorb financial losses like this a little bit more easily. Um, that this, I understand what was done as the initial knee-jerk reaction to COVID-19 response, and perhaps some of that is warranted, but now that there's been a couple months to really think about this and, and what are we going to do, um, it, it seems like nothing has changed Mr. from the Brewer, initial rolled if I can, out, if I can a more targeted that. solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. And our next caller on the line is Edmund Witter. Go ahead, Mr. Witter. You are unmuted. Uh, thank you, council members. This is Evan Witter from the King County Bar Association. I'm asking you to support 2020-0191 and its striker amendment. Uh, I just want to address some of the comments that have been made earlier. To the issue about whether this would bar any type of enforcement of a lease violation, that's not true. The striker very clearly states that as well. And I believe the original one just had some mis- uh, miswriting about what it was actually should have been said. It was referring to non-payment of rent as basically being barred under this. Seattle has already implemented these types of protections that are very similar to it. National polls that were just released today show that there was 89% support for a moratorium of evictions during the coronavirus outbreak because there's an pressing need right now to be able to have some protection. The language in the actual striker itself and the actual original bill is already narrowly, narrowly tailored to help those who have been impacted by COVID not just any tenant. So it just doesn't tell any tenant who can still pay the rent that you can get a free pass. It's protecting tenants who have been impacted by COVID. In order to save those most vulnerable to the coronavirus, we forced a lot of people out of their jobs. We cannot also now evict them from their homes. On the issue of rental assistance, we are very much in support of it. We run one of the biggest programs with United Way that provides rental assistance. We had $5 million in King County for the month of April, but within 48 hours, we were not able to help more um, the people who applied for it because, in fact, we got 7,000 applications in uh, 48 hours, but we're only able to help 2,000 of them. We currently just don't have the funding at the state level, the county level, or in the, at any other level except for the federal government to be able to provide that type of assistance. And the next point I just want to really emphasize about what this council said at the beginning of the meeting, housing is a racialized issue. Racists define this public health crisis. Racists define the criminal justice system, as we've seen recently, and racists define the housing crisis. People of color are going to be the ones who are impacted if you do not pass this type of legislation. They rely in, in, disproportionately on rental housing in King County. They are also experiencing unemployment at over twice the rate at, in which white residents are. 
by not providing these type of protections, you're ultimately sending a lot of people of color in our communities of color, making them face displacement at this point. I really suggest that you pass this legislation and really uh, make sure that you show that you care about also the people who have been impacted by this virus at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witter. The next person on the line has uh, the last three digits of their phone number as 562. Go ahead, you are unmuted. It looks like that person dropped off the line. So the next person on the line has the last three digits as 160. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Can you please state your name? Last three digits, 160, area code 714. If you'd like to speak, you are unmuted. Mr. Chair, I am going to go back to one last guest to see if I can bring them up. Felicia, Felicia, perhaps. Yes. NG. Yes. The person on the line with F E L I C A N G, if you would unmute yourself, you can speak. Doesn't appear that they are unmuting, Mr. Chair. And with that, I believe I've called everyone on the line. Chair, we got one more number. 562 is back. Oh, 562 is back. I have unmuted 562. If you'd like to speak, go ahead. Can you please give us your name? They dropped off again. I think they maybe do not want to speak. Mr. Chair, I think that's everyone. Is it possible to unmute everybody so I can confirm there's nobody else on the line who'd like to speak? I have unmuted everyone, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Everyone is unmuted. Is there anyone on this call who would like to offer public testimony? It hasn't had the chance to do so. I'm hearing no one. Thank you, um, Ms. Daly. We will close public testimony. Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I muted, I muted everybody and I couldn't hear you, so. And I'm unmuted now, I see. Can I get a nod that, or affirmation that somebody can hear me? Great, thank you. Our next ordinance is, um, item is Ordinance 2020-191, which would provide tenant protections during the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to alert my colleagues and members of the public who are listening that we may need to go into executive session to discuss this item. Um, Ms. Sanders from our central staff is here to provide a staff briefing. Ms. Sanders. Sure, thank you. For the record, April Sanders, Council Central Staff. The materials for this item begin on page 11 of your packet. Uh, proposed ordinance 2020-0191 uh, would provide uh, tenant protections for both residential and small commercial tenants. As a bit of background, Governor Inslee signed Emergency Proclamation 20-19 on March 18th which prohibited residential landlords from serving unlawful detainer actions, issuing a 20 day notice for unlawful detainer or initiating judicial action seeking a writ of restitution for non-payment of rent resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Governor Inslee subsequently extended that proclamation adding additional residential protections and extending certain protections to commercial tenants. A list of the protections granted in the extension can be found on page 12 of your packet. The extended proclamation expires this Thursday, June 4th. 
Subsequently, the city of Seattle passed a series of three ordinances making non-payment non -payment of rent due to COVID-19 a defense to eviction and providing for repayment plan options for residential and small commercial tenancies. Moving on to legislation in front of you, the proposed ordinance would create those tenant protections uh, modeled largely off of the city of Seattle's ordinances that I referenced previously, but amended to fit our administrative structure. The protections in the proposed ordinance would be available through September 1st, 2020, which marks six months from, the, from Executive Constantine's proclamation of emergency on March 1st. Starting off with residential tenant protections, the ordinance would provide residential tenants with a defense to eviction if an unlawful detainer action were based on the tenant's failure to pay rent due, if the failure to pay were because of circumstances occurring as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. These circumstances include the tenant's illness, loss or reduction of income, loss of employment, reduction in uncompensated in compensated hours of work, business or office closure, a need to miss work to care for a family member or child where that care is uncompensated or other similar loss of income due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The defense to eviction would be available to residential tenants if the eviction were initiated because of unpaid rent that was due before or by September 1st, 2020. Additionally, the proposed ordinance would allow a tenant who fails to pay rent due before or by September 1st, 2020 to pay the overdue rent in installments. If a tenant requests a written installment repayment plan, it would be negotiated between the landlord and the tenant. However, the repayment plan could not require the tenant to pay more than one third of overdue rent each month unless agreed to by the tenant and all rental debt accumulated must be paid by September 1st of 2021. The landlord would not be allowed to charge late fees, interests, or other charges. It would be an additional defense to eviction if a landlord refused a request to enter into a repayment plan. Moving on to protections for small commercial tenancies, the provisions model uh, the repayment plan I just outlined for residential tenancies. Um, for the purpose of this ordinance, small commercial tenant would be defined as a business entity that is owned and operated independently from all other businesses and has 50 or fewer employees per establishment, has either been forced to close to, uh, due to an emergency order issued by Governor Inslee or has gross receipts from the previous calendar month that are less than 70% of gross receipts from the same month in 2019. Additionally, it uh, could neither be a general sales and service business with 10 or more establishments in operation anywhere in the world, nor an entertainment business with five or more establishments anywhere in the world. That concludes my briefing on the underlying ordinance, Mr. Chair. There are amendments, a striking amendment and an amendment to the striker. Um, and we have Gina Kim and Darren Carnell from the PAO here to answer questions as well. Um, Council Member Balducci, how, we, how might you suggest we proceed? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I would ask if we could treat this as a briefing for the moment, have uh, April uh, brief the amendments, have discussion and questions and answers, and then I would like to, at that point, consider what my motion would be. Uh, we have we have heard a few issues uh, about the the concept here, and uh, some of them have been addressed in amendments. Some of them may be worthy of addressing in future amendments, and I would just like to think about uh, how we proceed after I hear you know sort of the Q and A from the members. So I would ask if you would allow uh, Ms. Sanders to complete her briefing and then I'd like to say a few words uh, about the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Sure, so striking amendment S1, which is in the amendment packet that Marcus sent out, I believe today. Um, the primary change would change the, the sunset date of the provisions essentially from September 1st of 2020, which marked six months from the executive's proclamation to March of 2021, which marks one year from the executive's emergency proclamation. So the protections would be available to tenants if the eviction were initiated because of unpaid rent that was due before or by March 1st, 2021. Um, additional uh, technical corrections recommended by the PAO and code revisor are reflected throughout the striking amendment, uh, mostly word changes uh, to change the some language in the Seattle ordinance to fit our administrative structure. And then amendment one to S1 um, would uh, add a section providing the same protections offered to residential tenants to tenants of mobile and manufactured home parks. This includes COVID-19 as a defense to eviction and requiring a repayment plan if requested by the tenant. 
And that concludes the amendments. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, Member Valducci. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sanders, did we have an additional amendment from one of the members as well? No, we do not. Okay, uh, thank you. And if that's okay, I'll just go ahead and, and say a few words then. Um, I, I want to just uh, speak as the sponsor of this uh, ordinance to the, the concept and what we're trying to do. Um, as has been correctly stated and briefed, there is a statewide eviction moratorium that was meant to keep uh, many uh, thousands of households from uh, suddenly losing their homes due to the really dramatic economic uh, impact of COVID-19. Uh, however, at some point that eviction moratorium is going to end. And at that point, we will be faced with truly a public policy crisis, a lot of individual crises. And I don't wanna downplay the impact to individual families here because it will, for every person and family that, this, that will potentially lose their home, it is a huge challenge and, and a very uh, critical moment. But as a public policy matter, it is a massive uh, challenge for us as a government, for our constituents to have a large number of people suddenly lose their home. I wanna remind us that we are currently living under four emergency declarations that are specific to our county a homelessness emergency declaration, an epidemic emergency de declaration, an economic uh, emergency declaration, and now the uh, the issue of the protesting and some of the um, issues going on in the streets. So the last thing we need is a tremendous number of people to suddenly all lose their homes uh, uh, for them and for our entire community. The intent here was really rather modest though. It is to say, and it may not be the last word on policy around evictions, but when the eviction moratorium ends, what this is attempting to do is provide a kind of a glide path. So instead of suddenly owing all the money uh, that was unpaid during the emergency uh, due to people who have lost their incomes due to this due to COVID, it gives them some time. It gives them the ability to negotiate a payment plan to pay off the arrearages as they're starting to, you know, sort of hopefully rebound and get income flowing again. And it gives a defense, not an eviction moratorium, not even for non-payment of rent is this an eviction moratorium. What it does is it gives somebody whose landlord is looking to evict them the ability to say in court in an eviction proceeding, I couldn't pay because I lost my income due to COVID. And the judge can take that information and weigh it in making a decision. That's what this does. It's really quite modest actually. And it's meant to keep people in their homes and start to paying the back rent uh, in, a, in a relatively uh, quick way. So I know it's not perfect. And I have to say that there are questions that have been raised that we have not addressed yet because we're moving relatively quickly since this has gone public. We've been working on it for a while, but since it's gone public, it's moved pretty quickly. For example, um, the comment about the no cause uh, eviction issue is, it's a very good one. It's a very good point that if you can evict someone, if you can't evict someone because they haven't paid their rent due to COVID and they have a payment plan, uh, if you also have the ability to evict them for no reason at all, that's just a, that is a, a loophole that the entire, uh, the entire protection uh, fits inside of. Um, I also have heard that we need clarity. I've heard from uh, the Rental Housing Association on behalf of landlords that the payment plan language has some lack of clarity in it and there's a little confusion. And as I look at it, I see that they have a point and it would make sense to make sure that we're being very clear about the, what the payment plan does and doesn't do. So I would like to have a little time, whether between now and full council or now and another committee meeting to work on that a little bit more. Um, I wanna say that uh, uh, a few more things. Uh, the comments about we should provide rental assistance, agreed, we should provide rental assistance. Rental assistance, assistance in and of itself is not going to solve the problem. I think we're gonna need a multi-pronged approach. And when we talk about the CARES funding that we have for community supports, I'm certainly gonna be uh, advocating in favor of rental assistance programs to help people stay in, in their homes and pay their rent. Uh, I heard the issue about uh, not being able to enforce rules of conduct. Uh, I will admit that in the first draft of this, and that as as, initiate, as we uh, introduced it, 
the ordinance did have some language that one could read and think that that it did that, that it removed the ability for landlords to evict people because of behavior or other violations of their contracts. That was not the intent of this ordinance. And we removed that language in the striking amendment. So I think that we've done a balanced job here. I know there will be questions and comments from colleagues, but I wanna commend this approach to everybody. I'm gonna be listening carefully to what the members have to say. And Mr. Chair, if uh, with your indulgence at the end uh, would call on me, I will at that time make a motion to be determined between now and then. Thank you. Colleagues, Council Member Uptegrove. Oh, why thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there was a lot of testimony and a lot of what I heard in testimony didn't match up with what I heard in our staff report for what this does. So I'm gonna try being a non-attorney here, April, to try to repeat back in sort of layman's terms. Uh, and one thing I don't think you were clear on that I think we know, but the public might is, we am I correct that we only have jurisdiction over uh, properties in unincorporated areas. So this would only right. apply to rental properties in unincorporated King County, not in any city. Correct. That's what I thought. And then, and, and forgive me, I haven't dove into this so that I'm sort of stating the obvious here to help communicate it, but also to get my head around it. Is it correct what Councilman Balducci said that we're not extending any prohibition on evictions? We're simply giving that if someone is evicted and they go to court, that they have the chance to argue and demonstrate to a judge that their failure to pay was due to COVID. And if that's the case, there's an option for, a re there would need to be a replacement plan. At Correct. That okay, that doesn't sound as scary to me. <laughs> um, in term And as I also happen to be a landlord and not an unincorporated, but um, the I'm interested in learning a little bit more about the details and mechanics, as Councilor Balducci said, but I kind of want to repeat that back in <laughs> lay members' terms to make sure I understood it, given there was so much testimony about things unrelated to payment to, pay, you know, ability to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, but if this is focused on, if you're looking for feedback, Councilor Balducci, if this is unincorporated areas, doesn't extend the moratorium and is simply a, a, de, a defense in court if you're being evicted and you can demonstrate it's due to COVID and you have to pay the money back, but it's on a conservative payment plan. I'm, I think that sounds eminently reasonable. And to clarify, there are two uh, defenses to eviction, failure to pay because of non-payment of rent and if uh, a tenant requested and a landlord refused to provide a repayment plan. So both are defenses to eviction. Thanks. So my feedback is oh. Zahalai. Council Member Zahalai. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I have similar questions to Council Member Uptogrove, and they're just clarifying questions. Um, does anything in this ordinance say that tenants can live for free in in uh, their homes? No, Council Member. Does anything in this ordinance forgive or cancel back rent payments? No, it'd still be owed. Does anything in this ordinance or the amendment say that landlords cannot evict quote unquote bad tenants if they have a good cause for doing so? No, if it if they have a, a an other reason for eviction, it would still be allowed. Okay. Yeah, I mean I felt like I, I personally was just very confused by the public comments from the landlords and I, I hope that the clarifications that we're providing right now are, are helpful uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Lambert. Council Member Lambert. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, this says that you can go to court. Our courts are backed up months and months. So um, and going to court's expensive. So especially if you have to wait months and months to get in. So then that means it's only longer that the person could be living in your property. So sending more work to the courts right now, I don't know that that's a good idea. We I mean, need to have some arbitrators or um, to come in and handle this work um, specifically. 
Um, I, I listened to what the people said about checking on whether or not the people had gotten unemployment and um, any other income. I think that some kind of income um, verification would be important if somebody is getting unemployment and especially lately that it's been um, supplemented with $600 extra a week, although I know that's changing. Um, they should have been at least paying something. Um, and then um, the comment that the lady made about this is putting these problems on the back of, of other individual citizens. Um, as council member Upgrove said, um, he's a current landlord. I am a recovering landlord, never to be one again, um, because I got left um, with a, land, a tenant who had been a long-term tenant um, at ill, promised that they would pay me back when they were no longer ill. The bill came to $10,000 at that point, and then they went in and filed bankruptcy. And therefore, I never got that money back. Um, so I think we need to deal with some issues about can they just go in and file bankruptcy? And then in that case, and like it's in my case, you just don't get your money back ever. So I think we need to look at um, what we're doing to small landlords and giving them a few more protections um, than what I see here. I, um, I've i read this and I can understand why a person who isn't used to reading these um, would say it's confusing because it, it was even confusing to me and I read these all the time. So um, so I think if we're going to do some rewriting in the next couple of weeks, which I think is a really good idea, I think going back and trying to make it have more clarity and less legalese, but more clarity so the average person can understand it might also be helpful. Thank you. Councilman Michael Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we all listened very carefully to all of those who provided public comment and, and was uh, confirmed uh, the issue that was brought up by Councilmember Up the Grove about discovering only the unincorporated areas of the county. But I do think it's, it's really critically important to understand the plight that uh, the smaller landlords, the mom and pops uh, landlords can be in uh, if there were not precautions for them. And I have been working with my colleagues, uh, my co-sponsors on, on amendments for this, but also for the uh, possibility of using COVID uh, excuse me, CARES funding in our next COVID omnibus emergency budget. So this is something that I just want to confirm that we are listening to. We understand the situation that has been brought out and uh, are hopeful that we can reach some agreement on addressing those important issues as well. Thank you. Councilmember Dombowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the sponsors for bringing this forward. I've appreciated some of the clarifying comments um, as well, and as well as the testimony. Uh, one thing that I'm looking at here with respect to the defense to an eviction and the residential portion is are the enumerated reasons, including an illness or uncompensated care. And one thing I would be interested in exploring is whether or not we could add a, a materiality um, component to that. In other words, there could be, as a result of the enumerated factors, a de minimis reduction in income. Uh, and as written, it doesn't ask the court in considering the defense to an eviction to look at whether or not the enumerated factor was a material or, or proximate cause of the inability to pay the rent, if that makes sense to use some legal terms. And I, I'm reluctant to set up a percentage. I know in the repayment program, there's a 30% number. Uh, you could set a percentage, but, but maybe it should be up to the judge considering all of the factors to address that. And, but I think we could give some guidance to the court and tighten that up a little bit to say that the enumerated causes there had to uh, lead to the inability to pay pay the rent. I would also be interested in um, exploring whether or not um, the defense uh, or the court should also consider the 
uh, hardship that might result on the landlord and the equities there. I think it's very hard in developing a, a law or policy of general applicability to account for all situations. Uh, but you could have a landlord that might be imminently facing foreclosure if the rent doesn't come in and she could demonstrate that uh, that would be a problem that I would hate to create by trying to solve um, a real public policy crisis with respect to housing. And I think if we empowered a court looking at these to balance the equities and weigh the equities, um, I would, I'd be interested in that. I'm a little bit interested in the math uh, with respect to the repayment deadline of September, 2021 and the 30% maximum factor. And I just, I can't, I haven't processed that all, but I wonder if there's a, a scenario where so much rent accrues accru accru is due and owing, but the limit on the monthly repayment results in a situation that there's no way to repay it all by September 2021 and how that works. I see Councilman Raducci smiling. <laughs> She's probably solved that. <laughs> no, I'm and, smiling in April because she had pointed this out earlier. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and then finally... Uh, and I'm just looking at this right. There are some exemptions for um, certain industries, entertainment, but greater than a certain size worldwide. And I just wondered what the what we're, what's going on there, um, the rationale behind that in the in the commercial section. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Councilmember, um, just a note for the repayment plan, um, and it's clarified a bit in the striker. Um, those Councilmember Balducci noted there, um, she's pursuing other uh, other clarifications but it's one third of the total rent due. So you could only pay, you could only require the tenant to pay one third of the total rent due per month, the overdue rent. So not one third of a month's payment, if that makes sense. I, I think I understand what you're saying. You're saying there's no mathematical way you wouldn't be able to recover the, the payments within the time frame of the ordinance. Yeah, hypothetically, at most, it would take three months if you- I see. Oh, I got it. Yes, thank you. And uh, I had some other questions there, but then I just thought from a legal perspective, and I know we may have an exec session on this, I do wonder about the contract clause where we're uh, eliminating late fees and things like that and, and whether we can impose those sort of contractual rewrites by ordinance uh, on the on private parties. Um, I, I would suggest that if we're doing that, to, if we're going to require that of folks uh, in the private sector, perhaps we ought to apply the same rules to ourselves in the collection of property taxes, where I think we, uh, at least to date, aren't waiving interest in, in late charges when people can't pay their property tax bill. So I think we should we should at least think about that, particularly where we might do something here where a property owner needs to pay their property taxes, maybe can't, can't get in a paying tenant because we would, again, the debt may be accruing, but collection of the debt's a different thing. Can't replace a tenant with a paying tenant because of the eviction moratorium and then leads to a default either on mortgage or property taxes and accrued interest and penalty there. I just think that's a, something we ought to think about. Councilmember Dunn. Councilmember Dunn. Reagan, you are muted. We do not hear you. You appear to be unmuted now. Joe, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, said the AT&T ad. Reagan, we just lost you. I'm assuming Council Member Dunn is gonna call back in, re reconnect. Is there another question in the meantime? Councilmember Dunn is confirming that he's getting in, re, that he's reconnecting. But I'd be happy to take a question in the meantime. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll pause for Council Member Dunn to reconnect. Hello? Yes. Committee of the Whole is pausing for a minute. Um, Council Member Dunn has a question and um, had technical difficulties, so was reconnecting to the meeting. And in, I'm unmuting him. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Council Member Dunn, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and I apologize for uh, having some technical challenges there. Um, and I don't want to go into an executive session uh, to prolong this meeting, but has there been an analysis done on the aspect of regulatory takings and or uh, tortious interference with contractual relations that someone can talk me through? at another time with respect to this piece of legislation, if it were to pass. Ms. Sanders, you're on mute. Sorry about that. We can either do that in executive session or uh, I could schedule a meeting with uh, we're done, Darren and Gina to go through that analysis. Uh, I, I, that's fine, fine with me, unless other members want to do an executive session. I don't think there's any need to prolong it. And then the other question maybe to the maker of the motion is, did you consider if there the idea of maybe providing some kind of taxable incentives of some kind for those landlords who engage in uh, these kinds of payment plans um, to deal with things like interest, late fees, um, a, a, an incentivized uh, program that might help uh, ease the burden on those that have to delay the income issues. Mr. Chair, if I may. Councilmember Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's no motion, but as the sponsor of the ordinance, I will I'll answer that. Uh, I think the magnitude of this problem is so large that we probably need to use all tools to hand. And I will certainly support and have already uh, advocated for rental assistance approaches and would absolutely support other programs to help small landlords that are in financial distress uh, to continue to be able to provide housing, but I don't think that's an or, I think it's an and. So that, that was my thinking in, in terms of uh, proposing this. And I don't know if you were on at the beginning, but I, I, as I've been thinking about what this, what this ordinance is meant to do, it's meant to provide a transitional period, kind of a landing glide path from uh, folks who have un been unable to pay their rent and have been accruing back rent during the eviction moratorium, which will end on one day. I mean, one day it will end and to try to allow some ability for them to not be all or en masse immediately evicted, but rather to work out a payment plan. And I do think we have a role as a government in helping to provide financial support into this problem as well in whatever way makes sense. So I support that, but I think it's an and not an or. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dombowski. Council Member Dombowski. Thank you. Following up on the last colloquy there between Councilman Balducci and Dunn and the timing, this um, would run through, I think, uh, September 1st. Would there be any expectation to extend the uh, protections afforded here if things, say, continue to get worse, um, given that the, this, the intention here, the thrust behind this is as a transitional um, piece of legislation. I, I worry we get to say August or September, what's the rationale for not continuing to extend the eviction moratorium and then the impact that might have on those with who own property and, and have obligations to pay? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll jump in if that's all right. 
uh, so the uh, just a reminder for everyone that the more the eviction moratorium comes from the state. So we don't control whether it will be extended or not. It, it will be the governor's decision whether to extend or not. In fact, it might expire before we complete this legislation. Uh, and if it is extended for a long period of time, we might have to come back and have that discussion. I would note that the striker would extend the protection period already from September 1 to March 1, 2021, uh, in recognition of the fact that this is already, we're into the fourth month now since we really started, um, or we're almost into the fourth month since the governor's proclamation. And it, uh, and given the phased ramp up period, this is likely to be, economic impacts are likely to go on for quite some time. Um, and I guess I, then I'll just fall back on one of my cliche responses uh, and, and you know, paraphrase myself, anything you can make with an ordinance, you can change with an ordinance. So we can always come back and, uh, and change it if necessary. I hope that answers your question, uh, Council Member. Uh, it, it does. I appreciate you noting that it would extend the defense. When I say moratorium, I mean the defense to the eviction uh, process outlined in this ordinance. At least I do in that case. So it would take it to March of next year. I see. Um, I, 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 I appreciate your optimism about being able to change things <laughs> with an ordinance that are, that are put into place by an ordinance, but people need to plan and, and people need to understand kind of the lay of the, of the legal landscape. And, and I think some consistency and stability in our laws is, is, is appropriate. Um, so again, I, I would uh, feel, some, feel more comfortable with some materiality requirements particularly given the contemplated um, time frame for these new defenses, which I, I think have merit uh, at their core. I want to say that. I think there, there's merit here, um, but uh, some, some, some uh, balancing of the impacts to the other side of the equation, I think it could be helpful. Lambert. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you. The balancing to the equation sounded great to my heart as a former math teacher. So thank you for balancing the equation. Um, I liked what I heard earlier from, uh, I started to say Senator Colwell's, but Council Member Colwell's about um, using some CARES money for this. And I think if we're going to do this, we need to have some balance so that we're not balancing uh, what's a social problem on the backs of individual citizens. Um, and I think that there needs to be some more clarity on what was said earlier about contractual rewrites. So I think this is something that um, maybe we should go into executive session about, and maybe we need a little more time on. Council, Council Member Lambert, is that a request to go into executive session to, to discuss issues appropriate for executive session? Yes, but I thought we should do that at the end of the meeting. Um, are we planning on taking action on this today? The sponsor has said that um, any motions you might make would be dependent on the conversation we've had um, in council today. Okay. Um, can you tell me logistically how that works? Um, when we're doing it remotely, do we have, I know we have the other number, do we have to go on to that and then come back again? How does executive session work? Yes. Yes, that, that is how it works. We have a separate Skype for Thank members if we, have an, if we have an executive session. So, okay. Um, that's, that's a lot of work getting in and out of that. Um, that slows things down for everybody. But Council, member, Council member Lambert, getting the job done is what's important. Uh, well is what's important here. Good. Well, with that attitude, yes, I, I, I think we should go in and really talk about some of these things. I, I have some concerns. Okay. I want to be clear that we'll be in executive session um, to discuss with legal counsel litigation or potential litigation to which the county is or is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the county. The committee will be in executive session for approximately, I'm gonna start with 15 minutes until about 4.15. I'm asking KCTV to please post the viral meeting to that effect. And I'm asking only council members and county employees directly necessary for the discussion to join the executive session by Skype at this time. Thank you.
tentative contract with the UW, um, they would be requested to conduct a retrospective analysis, the focus of which would be the effectiveness of actions taken by King County leaders and Public Health Seattle King County to limit the spread of the virus. The study is intended to be conducted with participation by public health and organizations that were directly, that are directly involved in the COVID-19 response in King County. Examples of such organizations include the University of Washington Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and the Gates Foundation. The motion requests the executive transmit a report to council based on the retrospective analysis and have it filed by June 30th of 2021. And that concludes my remarks. Happy to answer any questions. And we also have um, current guilt available for questions as well. Questions for Ms. Porter? Council, council member Dunn, as the sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the briefing. Um, this uh, is coming up a little more quickly than I, I was ready for in terms of full consideration. And so like the prior item, I, I'm going to ask that we have a little more time to discuss this. There is some overlap with the uh, what the internal auditor's office uh, may be doing, but I think there's a lot of success stories that can be told in what we did and also a lot of lessons learned relative to our early and, and midway responses to the pandemic. This was designed to be a long-term study. As you, as you heard, the reporting deadline is more than a year away. Um, and so I wanted to have a briefing. I wanted to have people uh, have a chance to ask questions. And I'd like to go back and, and talk with the relevant players to make sure there's not overlap before we actually take a vote, if the chair would allow it. Happy to have conversation questions today. And if there's no motion, there's no motion. Um, questions. What, what is the, I would ask, what is the time frame for when the motion proposes to begin its study and look back? Is it upon enactment or is it um, once a vaccine is developed? At what point when Washington State hits phase four? Is there a trigger for when we look back? I can answer that, Mr. I, go ahead, go ahead, oh, staff. Sorry. Um, the motion is not specific about when the, the retrospective analysis would begin. It um, indicates that the analysis should begin a far enough time in the future that experts are able to effectively analyze the pandemic response. Thank you. Clearly. Clearly, if this thing drags on for three years, then it's a different it's a it's a different time frame. Part of the reason for the genesis of this is I want to make sure that uh, we are all all of all of the various agencies involved taking copious notes and uh, collecting data so that we can really properly study this and have some empirical data. It, it's been 100 years since the last pandemic really hit the. Uh, the United States, but it could be 10 years or five years or 20 years. And the ability to collect data and learn a lot of information is useful, not only uh, in the short term, but it's also useful in the long term. So I'd certainly be open to suggestions. So I, I don't, I intend at this time to make a motion, appreciate the chair very much putting it on the agenda as quickly as, uh, as he did and uh, would look forward to working with my colleagues a little more and also uh, and specifically the executive branch of government. And hearing no more questions, we'll advance to item eight, um, proposed motion 2020-183, um, which asks the Office of Emergency Management and Public Health to update all of the county's emergency management plans to address the risks of pandemics. Um, Jake Tracy will brief us in the motion. Mr. Tracy, the line is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Jake Tracy, Council Staff. Uh, the materials for proposed motion 2020-0183 begin on page 33 of your packet. Uh, I'll keep this brief given the time. Uh, the proposed motion would request that the Office of Emergency Management, or OEM, update all relevant emergency management and disaster recovery plans and documents to address pandemics and with lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic 
and would request that Public Health Seattle and King County create a pandemic response plan. For King County. So um, a little bit on that pandemic response plan, there's an existing pandemic influenza response plan that Public Health uh, authored and was adopted by ordinance in 2006. Uh, the plan describes actions that various entities would take during each of the four pandemic phases identified by the World Health Organization in a variety of scenarios. And actions include social distancing, uh, isolation of cases, canceling of large social gatherings, a lot of things that probably sound a little familiar right now. Um, so that pandemic influenza response plan, uh, because the COVID-19 symptoms and uh, transmission method are similar to influenza, has elicited a similar response, but other pandemics in the future could uh, have different symptoms, different modes of transmission. And so this proposed motion would uh, ask OEM to come up with a, an overall pandemic response plan to respond to pandemics in general, not just pandemic influenza. Um, there's an, some specifics about what the plan would entail. Um, there is also a striking amendment that makes some changes. Uh, I, I will note that the striking amendment has a date, uh, makes the due date for this response plan, uh, pushes it back to September 1st, 2022, with a, sta a status report briefing to the council on September 1st, 2021 or before. Um, and the executive has also requested some further changes, but I'll pause there for any questions. Colleagues. Member. Council Member Lambert. Thank you. Two quick things. Does this include, and I didn't see it, I didn't see a um, stockpile inventory. Um, I think we probably should know, um, you know, what our stockpile inventory is and, um, and going forward so we can evaluate, you know, what we have and what we might want to have now that we've had a pandemic. And secondly, um, the role of zone leaders. Um, I will tell you that this cities in my area are very upset that the zone leaders are um, being done away with. And um, that is a huge, hugely important because that's who knew what kinds of emergencies there were to help people prepare and to supervise um, on an ongoing basis. So um, I would like to know if they are going to get rid of the zone leaders, which I think is a public policy question, what is going to be replacing those zone leaders? Uh, Council Member Lambert, on that first question, the motion does uh, call out that the pandemic response plan would have identification of critical infrastructure or resources that are currently lacking that would be required in order to respond to a pandemic and the barriers to acquiring or developing that infrastructure or resources and recommendations on how to fill those gaps. So that, that answers your first question, I believe. Um, the second one, I would have to defer to executive staff, who I believe that we have on the line uh, in terms of the zone leaders. Thank you very much. I believe, do we have Brendan McCluskey on the line from OEM? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Brendan. Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, on the... Uh, the second question, council member, uh, there are no plans to get rid of uh, the zone coordinator positions. We agree okay. it's a very important position to have there. It's uh, an advocate and uh, a link from us to the cities and uh, we absolutely are gonna be continuing that program. Council member Lambert, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, do you want me to be the one to tell them or do you want to be the one to tell them? Because one of us is going to make them really happy. So you can make them happy if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thank you. They're, they're both aware uh, that, that they are, uh, that the program is being continued. And they weren't yesterday. So, okay. Thank you. Further questions? Councilmember Dunn? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to put this before us and move motion number, what is that, Joe? 20. 2020-0183. Uh, 20-0183 uh, before us for consideration and to speak to it. Council member Dunn has moved adoption of, moved we give a due pass recommendation to motion 2020-183. Council member Dunn. Thank you. It's been uh, almost 15 years since uh, we did a pandemic 
uh, planning document. Uh, obviously, we're in the throes of one right now. We're learning an enormous amount um, and uh, plans that should not be lost on us. And so, um, you know, in, in this particular scenario, as you know, the you know the Department of, of, of Public Health, the Seattle King County Park, Department of Public Health, is is front and center, but they're being buttressed, I think, in a lot of different ways by our uh, Department of, of Emergency uh, Management. And this would call on uh, the executive branch of government through that department to uh, redo our plan, to improve our plan. Amount of time, but I think it's important right now that we start that process uh, so that we are ready to move more quickly in modern times in case this happens again. My great fear is that we get through through this, uh, you know, a year or two later, or before us, and we need to be ready. Uh, and I know I've worked very closely with the executive branch of government, and I believe we have their support, um, and uh, would commend this for your consideration. Further discussion. See, and I do, do you just want to clarify that there is a striking amendment and a title amendment? Council member Dunn. Uh, move uh, S1. Striking amendment S1 is before us. Um, Council member Balducci. I had a question, but I don't want to interrupt the middle of briefing the striking amendment. I can wait. Jake, why don't you talk about the striking amendment first and then we can do questions. Sure. So uh, the striking amendment um, makes a couple of changes. Uh, the one I mentioned, it pushes the due date from September 1st, 2021 to September 1st, 2022. Um, in the initial legislation, there was a requirement that uh, the, that the uh, public health come up with different specific plans for different types of pandemics that might uh, come about. In this uh, plan, it's just one overall pandemic response plan rather than individual plans for different types of pandemics. Uh, it requests that public health update their other relevant planning documents, not just that pandemic response plan. And uh, it updates some references to the existing plans that OEM has, uh, ha has authored. And so as I mentioned earlier as well, the executive has requested some additional changes uh, past that, uh, that doesn't keep you from taking action as S1 today though. Questions on the striking amendment? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting striking amendment S1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Striking amendment is adopted. We have ordinance 202183. Uh, T1. T1. Yeah, move move T1, Mr. Chair. Title amendment T1 is before us. See no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. T1 is adopted. We have motion 202183 as amended before us. Councilmember Balducci. Yeah, just a question. Uh, I know it's a motion and motions are non-binding. But assuming that the executive branch took up this uh, very sensible uh, path, uh, what, what resources will they will will they need to do it? I will defer to executive staff on that. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Councilmember. This is Brendan McCluskey again from Emergency Management. Um, the work will be added into ours, and I believe public health work plans and reflected in our budget requests to the executive. Uh, as you heard earlier, we are being asked to take general fund cuts, and uh, we're working with PSB now uh, and to see how that will factor in our budget request for the next biennium 2021 to 2022. So I don't think it, uh, the answer to Mike, thank you for that answer. I don't think the answer uh, changes the fact that it is a sensible thing for us to have all our plans up to date, uh, but it's just something that we need to keep our eye on going forward that the, the organizations we need to do this have the resources to do the work. And I, this is probably beyond the bounds of uh, Zoom uh, etiquette, but I just want to comment that the maker of the motion looks like he's sitting in a truck that has turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty close, Claudia, pretty close. The best I got here. 
Um, thank you, Claudia, for that. Yeah, and I, I want to be sensitive to costs. I, there's a lot of in-house work that I know the Department of uh, Emergency Management can do. And so um, I just think we, we, we have to do this. I mean, if we don't do our pandemic, update our pandemic planning document based on this, I think it's a, a big mistake that could cost us downstream. I'm sensitive to costs. And, and my hope is that delaying that turnaround time for uh, really, uh, 24 months uh, gives us the best way to defray that cost and get. It, hopefully we can get it done as much as we can within the absorption of the existing uh, personnel structure. So I'd urge your support. Seeing no further discussion, uh, um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci? Aye. Councilmember Balducci votes aye. Councilmember Dembowski? Aye. Councilmember Dembowski votes aye. Councilmember Dunn? Aye. Councilmember Dunn votes aye. Councilmember Colwells? Aye. Councilmember Colwells votes aye. Councilmember Lambert? Aye. Councilmember Lambert votes aye. Councilmember Up the Grove? Aye. Councilmember Up the Grove votes aye. Councilmember Von Reichbauer? Aye. Councilmember Von Reichbauer votes aye. Councilmember Zahalai? Aye. Councilmember Zahalai votes aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Mr. Chair, you have nine ayes, zero noes. Thank you. By your vote, we've given a due pass recommendation to motion 2021-83. Um, do we want to, uh, we will not put it on consent given that we may have additional amendments at full council. Do we want to expedite? No, we will not expedite. We'll send to full council in regular course of action. Um, next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's that's appropriate. Great. Um, next item would be to offer reconsideration for anyone who had missed a vote. Madam Clerk, I don't believe anyone has missed a vote. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, that takes us to item 10, other business executive session. The committee does need to discuss another matter in executive session. The grounds for executive session under RCW 4231.10 are to discuss with legal counsel litigation or potential litigation to which the county is or is likely to become a party when general knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the county. Committee will be in executive session for approximately 20 minutes until approximately um, 5.05. Um, I'm asking KCTV to please post the viral meeting to that effect. And for the public's information, I do not anticipate further business or votes after the executive session. I expect only to return to adjourn the meeting. Regardless, at the end of um, executive session, I will return to the full Zoom council meeting a committee of the whole meeting and adjourn the meeting. Um, I'm asking council members and any county employees directly necessary for the discussion to please join the executive session at Skype at this time. Thank you. So I believe I'm, um, it's fair for me to then call them the committee of the whole back to order and having completed our executive session and having no further business um, to come before us, we are adjourned. I want to thank everybody for their um, cooperation and good work through the committee. Um, thank you, Ms. Daly, Ms. Dedman, um, Ms. Calderon for all of your work in making this so successful. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Mr. Chair.